and you sort of look below and you look at the different parts of it, little parts of it will come loose and suddenly you're holding like a little Lego brick in your hand and you're like, what the hell is this thing? Like, did I just break it? Like, did I mess up? And that happens with the content and that happens with the tech, tech side of things as well. And when you walk into a hackathon or, or a conference like Wikimania, it's almost like you're talking to all these Lego experts and they're like, have you seen the latest A93 blue double layered brick? It's amazing. Yes, kind sir, it's wonderful. That's how I imagine people talk at Lego conventions. And, <laughs> and you're sort of intimidated and you're like, have no idea what they're talking about. But really, I hope I can help instill in you this sort of sense of wonder um, that you, you get when you learn something for the first time, if you are in fact learning it for the first time. So let me ask the folks in the room, it's a little wake up exercise, like how many of you consider yourself software developers? How many of you don't consider yourself software developers? Okay, so I would say that's actually like a 60, 60, 40 split. So for those of you who do say you're software developers, um, forgive me because I'm gonna explain some pretty obvious stuff. For those of you um, who don't, how many of you actually who did just say that you're not developers have ever edited a template on a wiki? So, right. <laughs> so the, the truth is that in the context of a wiki like Wikipedia, there's a lot of development work happening, there's a lot of technology work happening without people actually necessarily realizing that what they are doing is technology work. Um, templates are an incredibly complex concept. Who doesn't know what a template is? So three people here don't know what a template is. And for those three people, and for the rest of you who think you know, but might not. <laughs> so a template is essentially a block of content that you load inside another page. So like an info box or the little warning messages that come up on top of articles saying the neutrality of this article is disputed. And one of the nice things about templates is that they accept parameters. So you can say to an info box, I want an info box about a country with parameters like population or parameters like GDP or the, the official language and so on. And it renders a beautiful little table for you. And that table looks identical across all the articles about countries. Now, how this feed is accomplished is by having basically this uh, namespace in the wiki which is called um, template. And within this namespace, you can both have the actual sort of text that you want to render, but you can also do other things that are pretty complex. So what I'm showing you here, if you can see it, is code behind a template. In this case, what we're looking at is the code behind the template in English Wikipedia that's used for displaying citations, displaying footnotes. Um, and this code does a lot of things. Um, like it uh, actually doesn't just like render out the text of the footnote. When you enter a footnote in English Wikipedia and you give it like a value like first name of the author, last name of the author, year of the publication, um, that structure of the footnote is actually preserved in the resulting HTML. So if you run like um, a browser extension that extracts footnotes and stores them in a bibliography so you can write a research paper, it looks at that machine readable data and extracts it for you. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening here that's being done by this code that you're not aware of when you look at a Wikipedia article or when you use a template. This template is um, implemented in a programming language called Lua. We added support um, for Lua and templates a while ago. Can I ask who here has ever used Lua inside a template? So that's a much, much, much smaller group. So normally when you use a template, you might just like have it output some text, accept some parameters, do some interesting things. But with Lua, you can actually do full on programming inside the wiki. And what you see here is that this is actually a code editor. It is made to write code. It even has little debugging tools. It indicates syntax issues with your code. It helps you as you program your template. You can uh, debug its performance. You can test it in a number of different ways. And this means that you can sort of fluidly transition 
um, from being just a content author to being a template author to being a programmer of templates if you want to. Now, templates have very specific uses, and frankly, they're also often used for things they shouldn't be. Like, there's often a ton of very specific formatting uh, that's being applied at a very granular level, which is a bad idea, and it's fragile, and it's very specific for one output format, like screens. Like, it just doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, at the same time, they can be uh, used for a lot of really good things um, that are programmatic, like conversion of units, numbers, uh, things of that nature, where you actually want a little program to do the work for you. But there's another kind of programming in the wiki. Can I ask who has ever installed a user script or, or who has ever turned on a gadget in their preferences? Okay, who has no idea what I'm talking about? Okay, so most of you know what gadgets are. And so, well, that might be a presumption. Um, most of you have a rough idea what gadgets are. So. If I'm showing you my user preferences on English Wikipedia, then you notice in the gadget section you have this huge list of things um, that I can turn on, like navigation pop-ups, Twinkle, features that I can use in Wikipedia to do stuff and make my, my, uh, my work easier, make it easier to post message on other people's talk pages, uh, make it easier to navigate the content, um, all kinds of wonderful things. And none of this was created by the Wikimedia Foundation. Like, it was all created by content authors. If you go to different Wikipedias, um, you find different gadgets um, that you can turn on. Some of them are turned on by default. This is a very unusual feature. Most sites have nothing like this. And the way it works underneath is that Wikipedia allows you and makes it very easy to run JavaScript, a programming language, with every page view um, every, every page that you load in the wiki. And it's actually very easy to learn. So if you are not a programmer, if you did not raise your hand earlier, um, and you think this is not for you, um, I think you, you might find this actually a lot of fun to play with. There's a page on mediawiki.org, um, and by the way, all the links are on a, on a page called bit do slash newb. You see it back on the slides again. Um, so you can um, sort of poke around there a little bit. Um, so I, if you're not a programmer, I would not recommend learning Lua, um, the, the programming language I showed you earlier uh, that's used for templates in Wikipedia, because Lua is really a pretty obscure programming language. It's used a lot in gaming. Uh, it's used a lot for various kinds of embedded scripting. Um, but um, it's not a, a language that you'll find useful for um, everyday use on the web. JavaScript, on the other hand, is the language of the web. JavaScript is used all the time. You do anything in a browser. Um, you, you visit Wikipedia. You visit your email account. Your browser actually runs a bunch of code um, without you necessarily realizing it doing things for you. And MediaWiki, the software that we use for our sites, makes it very easy for you to write your own scripts. Um, to basically create a script on the wiki, um, have it do some stuff, and share it with others. So this page, Gadget Kitchen, on MediaWiki.org, sort of a super simple tutorial for uh, writing, uh, writing JavaScript on the wiki. There's actually a nice video here where Brian River, our lead software architect, explains it in detail. Um, I encourage you to, to watch it if you want to learn it in your own time. Um, but what can you actually do with this? So, when you run a script inside your browser window, that script actually has access to a lot of stuff. Um, it has access to um, variables uh, that got loaded when the page got loaded. So for example, the script can access the name that you're logged in as, your user preferences, a whole bunch of stuff about you as a user and can do stuff with that. But it can also talk to the website you're on. There are security restrictions about talking to other websites, but it can talk to the website you're on right now. So if you're on Wikipedia and you have a little script installed, it can post on your behalf. It can edit on your behalf. If you have admin permissions, it can even delete on your behalf. Like it can do everything you can do. It's a pretty powerful thing if you think about it. So let's say I want a very simple feature on the wiki, um, a feature that lets me just see what are the most recent edits that got made um, on the wiki. And I sort of want to pull that up very quickly with a hotkey 
Uh, so wherever I am uh, on the wiki, I can sort of see the most recent changes um, with the hotkey, in this case, alt slash. Um, I can just pull that up at any time. And you can also see it linked here uh, under the quick change lock link in the tools menu. And this is not a standard feature of the wiki. This is the tutorial script um, that you can play with here. Um, so if you open this page, media wiki tutorial quick RC, uh, JS, you will actually, again, it will load it in a uh, software editor, not in a wiki text editor. And you can write code in here. So I hope you can more or less read this in the back. I'll make it as big as I can without losing context. But this script actually does a whole bunch of um, and very interesting and, and powerful stuff. Um, one of the things that it does um, is it actually uses what are called messages. So it uses uh, interface messages to show the user interface, either in English or French, uh, depending on which uh, language uh, it is that you're browsing in. Um, you can uh, use either one of those two, and you could add more in the format that you see here. So what I do here is I define a variable. A variable is just um, essentially storing some, uh, some information that I can then later recall by typing the same name messages again. And inside this variable, I'm storing a bunch of values. So I'm saying, OK, here's a name, quick changes title, and that name is associated with the value hello there. Um, and then I have the same text um, in other languages as well. And using this lookup table, I can then uh, later uh, display the user interface. Um, so it now actually uh, loads this um, uh, set of messages into MediaWiki's uh, internationalization system, which is accessed here through uh, MW messages, and then I can later reference it. Now, another thing that you see here a lot is these dollar parentheses. This is actually a syntax that's unique to a programming library called jQuery. Who here has heard of jQuery before? So jQuery is incredibly popular, as you can see. And jQuery makes programming uh, in JavaScript much, 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 much less painful than it was about sec six or seven years ago um, before it became popular. It just gives you a ton of shortcuts to make your life super, super, super simple. Uh, like in jQuery, with just a few characters, you can access any um, part of the HTML, you can manipulate it, you can add to it, um, and you can do very, very powerful stuff very quickly. And as you can see in this piece of code here, I'm using a um, jQuery plugin called uh, jQuery UI, and that's the thing that actually renders the dialog, the window that you saw earlier where the changes are listed. So it's a very simple way for you to very quickly uh, make actually interactive features uh, with just a few keystrokes, just a few commands. So in this case, um, it actually um, does uh, something which is called chaining in JavaScript um, because it uh, executes a chain of commands in a single um, statement here. So it generates a bunch of HTML and then feeds that HTML into a dialog, which gets rendered on the screen um, using the little welcoming message that we had defined earlier. Now, all of this is pretty basic stuff, but it gets really, really interesting once you actually start um, talking to the API. So an API is an application programming interface. When you use the web, um, you use APIs all the time without necessarily knowing that you are. Um, websites talk to each other that way. Your browser talks to other websites that way. When you use Visual Editor, when you use Upload Wizard, when you use many, many interactive features, your browser actually uses the API, the application programming inf interface provided by our software to upload files, to edit pages, and so on and so forth. So using an API, you can do almost everything that the user can do with very, very, very few exceptions. Um, so in this case, what we're actually doing is we're building an API query here. Um, so there's actually a bunch of shortcuts that are already defined for you for using the uh, MediaWiki API. And we're getting a particular list back, uh, the list of recent changes, with a limit of 25 of them. And then we're processing those changes. Um, we're putting them in an array, and we're rendering them out as HTML links, as you saw earlier, 
um, it just gives you this uh, nicely formatted list back. Um, so this is all that's happening here. Um, but it's pretty powerful stuff, because you're really actually working with data. Uh, you're working with data from the, from the real website. But that's still all happening in, uh, the, world of, um, in the world of the, the web browser. So what if you uh, have, to have something that's more sophisticated, that performs a, a series of edits, um, that actually needs to run in the background. Uh, you don't want to be logged in um, while it's happening. So that's when you uh, start talking about bots. Uh, that's when you want to automate a large number of, say, editing tasks in Wikipedia. Now, bots do an incredible amount of work nowadays. Um, you may have read in the news that in Swedish Wikipedia, a bot now made Swedish Wikipedia the second largest Wikipedia in terms of number of articles, you know, something like 1.8 million articles, a lot of articles about species, uh, towns, and so on, that are created by a robot. You can think of that what you will, but there's no doubt that bots do an awful lot of useful work in the wikis. If you want to learn how to write a bot, now the truth is, writing a bot for Wikipedia is one of the easiest things you can possibly do. And the reason is that Bots have been around for a long, 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 long time. And so the programming of bots has been made very, very easy by the people who have been writing them for the last 10 years. There's a library called PyWikiBot, which is linked from the URL that you see there, um, which makes it possible within like four commands, edit a page, replace some text. Um, it uh, basically retains your user credentials um, very easily, and you can perform complex commands with, um, with very little effort at all. Um, I'll actually show you a very simple example of that. Let's see. So in this case, what you're actually doing is, first of all, you do in loading the library, import PyWikiBot. You have to have it installed on your machine, of course. You're defining the site that you want to log in. In this case, I'm logging into my locally installed wiki. You're um, defining the page that you want to edit. Um, you load the page and replace a bunch of text in that page and then save the changes. Almost no effort at all. Really, really trivial. And the nice thing about it is that it actually comes with pre-configured settings for Wikipedia and all the other Wikimedia projects, as well as uh, many non-Wikimedia wikis as well. You don't have to do any configuration work at all. Um, you just put in your username, and you're ready to go. Um, don't do it, though, if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Not for Wikipedia, anyway. <laughs> Um, the, the rules for running a bot on, on Wikipedia are pretty strict uh, nowadays, um, and you have to go through an approval process and convince people that what you're doing is actually going to be a good idea. Um, if you uh, do it on your local, uh, local wiki, do whatever the hell you want. Um, but uh, running a bot on Wikipedia itself is something that you do want to be a bit careful about. Um, PyWikiBot uh, implements a bunch of measures internally um, to actually um, sort of hold you to account a little bit. It uh, slows down the bot on uh, the rate of edits uh, that, you, uh, that you can make automatically so you don't um, hammer the site, all kinds of small little, uh, little tweaks like that. Um, so it's, it's a nice, nice little framework to experiment with. So if you take nothing at all uh, uh, other than this away from this, like this is a fun little thing to experiment with, and it's very, very, very easy. You don't have to use Python, by the way. This is the Python programming language. There are bot frameworks uh, and many other programming languages. Um, there's one in Perl that's linked from the, um, from the, uh, from the uh, link list. Um, so the Perl one is actually, uh, in my opinion, um, just as easy to use if you like Perl, uh, which I hope not. Um, so in addition to writing a bot, you also want to run it. And if you want to run a bot, you have a couple of choices. Um, you might want to run it uh, on your own machine, uh, let it um, basically perform a bunch of operations um, overnight, um, and then um, come back to it in the morning and see if it messed up. And that's, that's totally fine, and that's how, how a lot of bots have run over the years. Um, who has run a bot on their own computer? 
Um, so a lot of people here, like a handful at least, have run bots on their own computer. And that's, that's a totally reasonable way to do it. Um, but you can also run it on a server. You can run it on your own server. You can run it on someone else's server. And you can run it in Wikimedia Labs, which is a set of um, um, machines um, that are provisioned by the Wikimedia Foundation just for the purpose of um, volunteer um, innovation and development. And in this particular case, um, you can um, run it within a system that's specifically set up for running bots. Uh, so you can schedule when it's going to run, you can monitor its operation, and you can have other people help you um, work on it with you. And that last part, I think, is the most important one, because what often happens is that you work on a bot in your own time, uh, it does amazing stuff, and you get tired of it, you get bored of it, and it stops. Um, so by releasing the code, making it open, and working in a shared environment, you can make sure that other people can pick up on your own work. Um, so within Wikimedia Labs, um, you can basically do a bunch of things. You can um, run bots, um, but you can also write more comprehensive tools and hacks of various kinds. Uh, so let's actually do something here. So I'm now logged into Wikimedia Tool Labs. You can log into Wikimedia Tool Labs as well. Um, any, uh, uh, any computer you have, uh, you can request an account on Wikimedia Labs, um, and you just specify um, what you want to use it for, what kind of project you want to run. The links are, again, in the link list. And you can do stuff. Now, what can you do with it? Um, well, I'm now in a, in a Unix environment, uh, so I can write a bot, I can run a bot, um, there's documentation on how to do that kind of thing, but there's something else that you can do that's very cool. You can actually log into the database. So let's actually make this a little... So I'm now on the database for English Wikipedia. Freaking scary, right? The actual real thing. So what can I do with that? Can I delete everything? Well, I can. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, you can do a, do a bunch of very interesting things. Um, but um, what if I wanted to see my, my email address, um, for example? That's kind of scary, right? Uh, so let's say I want to see the user ID and the user email from the user table where the username equals eloquence. And, oh, I don't have a user email. Um, it just says no. Well, I actually do have an email. It just doesn't return it in this particular query because the databases um, that you have access to in the labs environment are what we call sanitized. So a lot of the private information, well, all of the private information, if we did our jobs, um, isn't available to you. Um, and at the same time, you can get at everything that you can get, get at through the site itself um, you can get uh, added programmatically, and you can run bulk queries. You can run analytics of various kinds. Uh, you can basically uh, compute edit counts or uh, generate reports of pages that match certain criteria. And a lot of the tools that people have built uh, within labs do exactly that. So if the API isn't enough, um, this takes you very, 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 very much further. Um, so you cannot just run um, bots. You can build very sophisticated tools you can even install MediaWiki inside labs uh, and de develop features for it. Um, so you can do very sophisticated things in this environment. So finally, and um, then I'm, I'm going to start wrapping up um, to give Mark some time to show you actually some of the cool things that people have built um, within labs. I want to talk a little bit about Vagrant and Puppet. Who comes up with these names? It's just awful, right? And this is the actual logo that the Vagrant people use. Like, seriously? <laughs> it's just, I don't know. Um, but there's a kind of method behind the madness, because this friendly hobo here um, is posing in front of a cardboard box. And the reason is that Vagrant is all about boxes. Uh, Vagrant is a system um, that was developed for managing virtual machines, managing virtual environments. Who here has no idea what a virtual machine is? Come on. 
All right, so most of you have a, a sense of what a virtual machine is. Um, it just allows you to sandbox a development environment much more easily. And Vagrant is very, very, very powerful stuff. It doesn't only allow you to manage a secure, isolated development environment. It allows you to manage all the dependencies for it. Uh, it installs software for you using another system called Puppet. Uh, Puppet is a system that was developed for um, especially larger scale infrastructure environments where you have a lot of configurations that you have to manage, a lot of dependencies you have to manage. So let's say you install MediaWiki on your own computer. You have a database, you have a web server, um, you have the PHP interpreter, um, but you might also have other things increasingly like Node.js for running the new parsing service used by Visual Editor, all kinds of very complicated things and acronyms um, galore. Um, and it takes a long time to get it all up and running. Uh, Vagrant, uh, in combination with Puppet, does this magically for you. Um, what it basically allows you to do, in very simple terms, is it gets you a development environment up and running within a few minutes, um, including any kind of um, um, uh, extension for MediaWiki, that, uh, almost any that you might want to dream of. Um, so I actually have it running here. See. Oh, I'm still on tulips. Doo, doo, doo. So, in this case, I'm actually not logging into a remote server. I'm logging into my own machine. I'm logging into um, a virtual machine that's running um, on my computer that is managed by Vagrant. And within this environment, I, as a super user, I can install software. Um, I can manage MediaWiki, um, but I can also uh, use the um, provided scripts to get new software up and running. So Vagrant has this system called roles. And using these roles, you can install any number of things with just a single command. So for example, you can see here that I have the mobile and the visual editor role enabled. That means I have the mobile skin running, um, I have the new editor running, I have the new parser running, and all of this took no um, effort whatsoever to set up. It does it for me autom automatically. And um, it, it takes a while to sort of wrap your head around how everything works, and it also breaks an awful lot, because it is a development environment, um, and every other week uh, some new change comes in that's gonna destroy everything you've carefully set up. Uh, you should very, very much treated as fragile and as something that you're gonna destroy and uh, reset uh, every other day um, just uh, as a d uh, development and testing environment, not as a stable thing where you put anything that you care about. Um, but if you treat it as such, it's an incredibly fun way um, to explore almost any new complex feature that say the Wikimedia Foundation is developing, that volunteers are developing and get it up and running within just a few minutes. Um, again, the instructions for that. Are, are in the links um, as well. And you're interacting when you use Vagrant um, with, with Puppet an awful lot. And Puppet, the configuration management system that's used for getting all the dependencies for installing, say, the Visual Editor or MediaWiki extension you care about, that same configuration management system is the one we as the, at the Wikimedia Foundation use to manage all our, our sites and service, services, all the Wikipedia sites, all the other sites, are managed using Puppet. So once you learn how Puppet works, you can actually potentially even make a contribution to how the Wikimedia Foundation environment runs. You can understand it. Uh, you can sort of figure out, hmm, how did you guys set up your Apache and your MySQL and whatnot? Uh, so you can really start uh, getting as granular as you want, because all our configuration is public, and you can contribute to it, and you can be a part of that um, as well. And um, within Wikimedia Labs, you can use these same tools to build systems, to build services, and to build very complex and powerful things. So uh, including uh, MediaWiki extensions uh, like Visual Editor itself. And um, Marc-André uh, Pelletier uh, is, is the guy who uh, uh, runs um, essentially in partnership with, uh, with a, a couple of other engineers the Wikimedia Labs environment. And he's going to show you um, some of the very exciting stuff that people have already built uh, within the Wikimedia Labs environment. So um, happy hacking. Um, please do uh, take a look at the, 
at the links, and uh, we can go into a QA and a a little bit after uh, Mark Andre's talk. Thanks, guys. Um, hello, everyone. I'd like to start by apologizing. I managed to get a cold two days before the talk. So if I'm a little coffee or I speak from the nose a little bit, not my fault. Um, thank you, Eric, uh, for opening my show. <clears throat> so I'm here to showcase all the cool things. Um, at least that was the intent. I wanted to run through all the cool things all the developers, the community has created around the projects. And then I ran into a little problem. Um, there's too many of them. Um, I started looking just at the things that were done on our infrastructure in the past year. Several hundred tools, all hard working from hundreds of developers. Um, those numbers are actually probably out of date because I wrote this about two weeks ago. And that's just two labs, there's just one lab project and that doesn't even count things people are running on their own servers, on other servers. There are lots of developers around who do a lot of really, really cool things. So I found myself overwhelmed. Um, it's cool, there's a lot of things but even this morning, I still had at least three, four, five tools on my really, really short list that I had to cut. So I'm making a warning, a disclaimer. This is not a best of list. Um, I did not seek, oh, this is the very best tool. These aren't the Academy Awards. I'm not giving out Oscars. These are things that as I looked through all the things people did, I found were really, really cool. Um, lots of bots, lots of tools do hard grunt work for the encyclopedias, for the wiki source, for Wiktionary, for all the projects. They are the backbone um, of the infrastructure. They're really useful. Some of those I'm going to show aren't that useful. They're just cool things. Um, and they're probably not even cool for everyone. I mean, something I find cool, you might not find cool. So I end up having picked up a sampler, um, some representative really cool things, doing all sorts of things, uh, but I'm barely scratching the surface here. I'm showing you things that are really cool, and I'm going to actually show you how they work, but you have to go and look for yourself. There are more things than I could probably show if I had the whole day, and then you get bored or something. And each and every one of those tools, each and every one of those little toys or hardworking bots do something interesting. They've been made by the, commu the, the community, by the developers who contributed with code, with effort, with technical effort, as opposed to contributing contents and editing the projects. Um, so I'm going to show you this short list of really, really cool things I found. Um, is, uh, imagine the drum roll here. Um, the first one I want to show you is the Reasonator. Um, who here is familiar with Wikidata? That's a lot of people. Now, Wikidata is a really, really interesting project in itself, but fundamentally it's a database. Um, it has dry facts, um, very carefully classified, very carefully organized, and it's also really complicated and really hard to understand for day-to-day -day users. So, wait, that didn't work. There we go. So, what the Reasonator does instead is give you a human-readable version 
of any of the Wikidata entity. So here I pick the typical example of Johann Sebastian Bach, Wikigod wanting, there we go. Now, none of this has been written by humans. This is all data extracted from Wikidata and presented in a human readable, <coughs> sorry, human readable and arguably human friendly format. But all of this is machine readable fundamentally. And one of the really cool things about this is that it doesn't depend on your language. The only thing it depends on, let me try and zoom this in. That's going to be, um, there we go, that's a little better. Um, the only thing this does is take the raw data and present it to you in whichever language you feel like using. Um, it's a really good default view over the actual raw data, but that's, that's not something Wikidata does. That's something a volunteer did in order to make things easier for humans. Um, that really didn't do what I wanted. Help. Oh, there we go. There we go. And um, by the way, um, please take note, the bold names at the top of the description, those are the community members who did this. You will sometimes see staff, uh, Wikimedia staff names pop up there, but it's never done in the line of work. It's always a, a work of passion, a work of, ooh, hey, let me try this cool thing. So the Reasonator is making raw data readable to humans. Um, family Tree is making it pretty. Um, family Trees also takes its data from um, the Wikidata database, but rather than present it in a prose-like format with the pretty pictures and things like that, it shows you relationships uh, between these different things. And so what it does is that it digs in the database. Right now, only it's a kind of a prototype for persons, and then it looks for all the father of, sibling of, mother of relations, and displays it to for you graphically, and gives you a graph like this. So we've got Johann Sebastian Bach here, which if we click on it, click correctly on it, I think the wiki gods are against us. Oh, there we go. Um, we get a mobile view on the sidebar of the actual article from English Wikipedia, because my default language is English. Um, I follow one of the nodes, and bam, I've got the information available on one of his daughters, his first daughter. And interestingly enough, there's no article on it. <laughs> yes, um, also because she wasn't a musician, I believe. Um, but there's no article on her, and yet it uses Reasonator again to extract at least everything we know about her. Uh, and make it available. So again, we've got the same database underlying Wikidata, but we've got a new way of looking at the data, of extracting the data. That was done by volunteers for a completely different reason. It's like, oh, we've got this data, let's try and show it nicely. Um, and this is Xavier Reilly and Magnus Manx. I'm pointing out this particular name. You see Magnus Manske? I'm not entirely sure how it's pronounced. You'll see that name pop up over and over and over again in very many of those tools. I think he's one of, mo uh, of our most uh, prolific and dedicated tool writers. Yes, I'm a hand of applause. And then there's the fun stuff. Um, Wiktionary is kind of sometimes a little bit neglected um, by the tool writers, I think, uh, because it's a nice base of information about words themselves, and I love words. Um, and so we've got one tool writer, uh, Dark Dada, who wrote another way of finding things in the French Wikipedia. Um, that tool actually only right now works for the French Wikipedia. I'm guessing that some people will start writing, uh, adapting it for other wiki, uh, sorry. Did I say Wikipedia? Wiktionaries, uh, soon. So what it allows you to do, instead of finding new ways of showing you information, it found new ways of allowing you to search for information. Um, and this one I'm, I can actually show you, but it's a little uh, terse. Obviously that's programmer user interface right there. Um, and what it allows you to do is search through Wiktionary for anagrams, for sound alikes, 
uh, and lookalikes, rather than doing the alphabetical thing that you'd expect from a dictionary. Now, obviously, if you think about it, all that data is already there. If you look at their dictionary entry, then you've got the pronunciation for every word, and you've got this huge database of words, um, which is sorted in a way that you can find when you know what word you're looking for. This allows you to search in ways that were not intended by the MediaWiki developers. So let's try something funny here. Um, let's look for an anagram of uh, P-E-R-E -E in French, in French again. Um, and after some crunching, um, we seem to have a really fast Wi-Fi right now. Um, after some crunching, it will eventually, it would have eventually, <clears throat> There we go. It would have, it, it, what it gives us is every word written with those letters in that language. It's anagrams. Um, it seems superficially, um, how can I say this? Um, it seems like a toy. But it is still extremely illustrative. These are new ways of looking for the information that we already have. We've got a lot of data. Let's find new ways of looking for it. Let's find new ways of presenting it. Of, of showing it to people. But that's not all it can do. Oh, that's another interesting geohack. Now, this is the one tool that nobody knows about that everybody has seen and most people have used. Um, in articles, <coughs> sorry about that. In articles, you will often see this little thing, coordinates, little globe, and then the actual coordinates, latitude and longitude of a geographical feature of an event, uh, or of a building, or things like that. That little link brings you to the geohack. Now, this is interesting because it does the opposite of what everybody else is doing. Rather than find new ways of showing you the information we already do have, this one gives you a list of all the information we don't have. Um, all the databases that aren't ours, but that exist, that can give you further details. So by following this one link, it's giving you the list of everything that you can possibly find with more data about it. So you've got Bing Maps, Google Maps, obviously, all sorts of maps. Um, pointer to other Wikipedia articles talking about those coordinates. Um, and through Wikipedia World, you can do things like, sorry, um, show me everything within 100 kilometers of those coordinates. So if you want to see what's related, and it's still loading. <clears throat> I have faith. Um, there we go. You can actually find every single Wikipedia article that talks about something within 100 kilometers of that coordinate. Now, it's not data that necessarily we have, but it is more data. It is more easily accessible data for everyday users, and that's a good thing. Um, but. Oh, I keep forgetting which ones I kept. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So forward to libraries is about more sources. Now, we all know our obsessions about finding sources, and, well, it should. Um, what I, when you're doing research, we've got a reference section. As you notice, in very many articles on the English Wikipedia, um, there's this box among the resources, library resources about whatever the article is. If you follow that link, or one of those links, not only you will find a list of libraries, but you'll actually get a search, the ability to do searches in your local libraries for books about the subject for which the article was about. Now, I followed randomly the Calgary Public Library. Um, I'm not even from Calgary. But I see the catalog here of all the books about Aristotle. If I need to work on that article, or I need to do a paper, or um, um, any kind of research, I want to find more sources forward to library. It will simply allow me to look in local um, library directories. And all of that is done by volunteers again. Um, and then there's ways to add information. That's good. Um, how many people here have tried uploading a video to comments? How many failed? Yeah, that's painful. Um, one of the things about uploading videos that, first of all, videos are huge, 
and you've usually got to convert them and do all sorts of really complicated maneuvers for the typical users. <coughs> convert to video is a very simple tool. I'm not going to actually demonstrate that one because I don't have a video to upload. But it allows you to um, take the output from your camera, your phone, and drag it onto the tool, and it will upload it with your credentials onto comments. Um, making video uploading easy um, is probably one of the biggest goals, I think, of the media team at the foundation. Turns out there's already people working on it, too. Uh, and again, volunteers. Um, crop tool. Um, anybody here ever use crop tool? Uh, just a few people. Um, it's an interesting combination. This is a really good example of how you can extend functionality with external tools. Now, it's a gadget on Commons, and it's a tool that runs in Tool Labs. And what it does, it's very, very nice. It allows you, while you're doing your normal editing and um, image handling on Commons, am I still logged in? Yes. Um, it adds this link in the tools. Mm, it's, there we go, crop tool. So I've got this image, this file. Click on crop tool. And I can now simply either automatically or precisely select a region and decide, well, I need to make another image from that, cropped, and either replace the other image or make a new one. It's going to send it with my credentials, again, because it uses OAuth, upload the new image, specify in the comment what the original source was, what exactly the cropped was, and then send it to comments. I'm obviously not going to replace a picture of the day with a random crop of part of it. But the idea is, if I hit that upload button, it would do so transparently, returns me to the image page. As far as the end user is concerned, that's just some new feature of comments. It's not. It's a tool written by a volunteer. And more cool stuff. The Wikidata game. That's actually very new and not very polished yet. Um, Wikidata is a wonderful project, but editing it tends to be a little on the boring side. Um, entering entity numbers and then carefully assigning relationships and properties to all of those things is a labor of mm, minutia rather than labor of love. So what um, Hey Cranen and Ryan and a lot of other people have done is gamify it. Make it into a game with easy objectives and simple things that anyone can enter. And so you find yourselves with simple tasks made into um, game-like properties. Now, I'm certain that other people will comment on whether those games are fun or not, but that's not the point. The point is to make things into bite-sized um, um, bite size easy task that can then be assigned by newbies, that can be done by newbies. And um, so rather than have a new way of, of viewing the data, here you have a new way of editing it. So you get games like Person. For example, you see an entry, is this a human or not? That seems like an easy question for a human to answer. Obviously, a bot has a lot of problem. Um, or you get gender. Hmm, is this describing a male or a female? As a human, we tend to be really good at finding those things out. Um, but not so much. So by displaying these tasks, these maintenance tasks, as simple, self-contained, fun objectives, uh, you manage to, to allow people to do a lot of work in a way that, well, doesn't feel quite as much like work. Um, and I, I've saved one for last. This one is actually a little older. It's about a year old. But it is so interesting fundamentally. Again, we've got all this data already, and we want to have new ways of looking at it. Now, you've seen Family Tree, which was all about relationship organization and digging into this. 
um, using Reasonator, which was, let's take this huge pile of data and present it in a way that a human par can parse it. This one is art. This one is simply taking the recent changes feed from a project, by default the English Wikipedia, and making it sound. And look. You hear those chimes? Those are edits. Right now, it's, people aren't editing very much. Can you turn it on a little bit? Oh, no, okay, see, there's an idiot in the room, and that one is me. I didn't actually plug in the audio. You may laugh now. There we go. Now that's taking raw data and making art. It's probably the least useful of the tools that I've shown. It's probably the least um, hard working of them. But it is a new interesting way of listening to data. Um, by the way, if you hear a background chime in the blue bar at the top, that's a new bee joining us. I'm going to leave the sound in the background just to let you hear um, activity on Wikipedia. And now I have a confession to make. Um, all these cool things I've shown, there's actually an agenda behind this. There's a pattern that I was hoping that you would detect. Um, just by a show of hands, does anyone know, did anyone notice a particular pattern in which tools I've shown? I didn't think I would be that obvious. All of it is made possible because of open data. Um, every one of those things, every one of those tools that I haven't shown exists because we've made the data open, because we made certain that everything that goes in can come back out. Indeed, must come back out. Um, we've got the history, we've got the activity. You, you can hear it now. There's new data coming in. Um, we've got a lot, a lot of valuable things, but their value lies only in the fact that anyone can sit down, write a new tool, and extract information out of the data. Um, so it's an invitation. Look at this. Think of all the data. Think of all the cool new ways you could extract fun stuff from it or useful stuff or stuff for your next research or perhaps the next revelation in the data. What will you make next? And that's the invitation that I make to you. Um, you that was just a bit too fast. And now, Wikimedia does make a number of resources to make it easier to write tools. Um, to access the data, to reach the databases, and we're glad to put them, make them available to you. But in the end, the one thing that counts is the vision that you'll have. What kind of cool new thing can you get out of that data? Thank you. Thank you. So um, I should warn you, I'm not a Wikipedian. I have a talk page, but if you go look at it, you will find that I say on it that I have no edits. Um, 
I think I'm here as a friendly, curmudgeonly stranger who is here to maybe slay some sacred cows for you. I think this is possibly the most idealistic group of people I have ever had the pleasure of speaking to. I, however, unfortunately, have spent much of my career in the belly of giant media companies working as an executive at places like Sony and Disney. So that means I am actually pretty cynical. So uh, if you don't like what I have to say, please feel free to AFD me after the talk. Uh, some of these games already got mentioned, but I just want to tell you that the reason why I think I can talk a little bit about Wikipedia is because my background is in building virtual worlds, online communities, and I've been doing it since about 1992 or 1993. Um, I also have spent quite a lot of time examining things like uh, the rights of users of virtual communities, how games function on a mechanical level, and things like that. And uh, I think it has quite a lot of lessons to offer you, um, which, again, you probably won't like. So let me start out by talking a little bit about games in general, uh, not to disagree with Mark, but yes, the Wikidata minigame really does need to be fun. Um, why? Well, fun is primarily a biochemical reaction. It's endorphins. It seems to be implicated with dopamine, which we don't entirely understand. It's driven primarily through curiosity and sensations of mastery. I think uh, curiosity immediately should resonate with any kind of Wikimedia community since you are in the business of fostering it. Um, mastery, however, is something Wikipedia has not yet mastered mastery, providing mastery. It's not really something you've tried to solve yet. Um, there's quite a lot of studies done. Many of them come from outside of games, of course. Many of these names are probably familiar to you. Concepts such as deliberate practice, which is mangled in the media as the 10,000 hours thing. Never listen to Malcolm Gladwell's uh, summaries. Um, uh, Nicole Lazaro has done things like using Paul Ekman's microexpressions research in order to look at what kinds of facial expressions and emotions are elicited by different sorts of game mechanics. So we do actually have a fair amount of empirical data on how games function using the human brain as a canvas. And uh, really, there's, there's basically only a few sorts of problems that make games fun, okay? Games are driven by problems and constraints. Uh, as uh, one philosopher put it, it is the attempt to overcome voluntary obstacles that makes something fun. Golf would be a lot simpler if you didn't have to hit the ball with a stupid stick and just went and dropped it in a hole and if the hole were bigger and so on, right? So you impose limitations on yourself. Classic game types, mastering physical reactions. The roller coaster. This is why a roller coaster is fun. Mastering social situations. This is why Cards Against Humanity is fun. The one most people think of when they think of games is actually math. Figuring out webs of complex systemic relationships, particularly problems that fall in NP range of complexity class. Uh, children's games are often a little lower. We outgrow them. We're basically looking for math problems that we have to use heuristics rather than an algorithm for. And finally, the degenerate case, which is gambling, which we have a software bug, so we always fail to get this one right. So game designers use randomness all the time in order to uh, hook you. We get the dopamine burst whether or not we're actually making progress. And all of this is built into a loop. And I'm going to throw up this loop a whole bunch of times as we look at Wikipedia today. This is a super simple version. The full version of a loop like this has more like 50 bubbles on it. But fundamentally, what we're talking about is that human brain, that canvas that I work with, has a mental model of how something works. And then they poke the object that they're examining, be it the game, be it Wikipedia. They poke it and they see what kind of reaction does it elicit. And the game updates state, and then it might not tell you everything that changed, it might only give you hints. It's a black box, right? And we try to figure out what's in the box based on the feedback that the system gives us. Without that feedback, we can't figure out anything and we won't have fun. So poor feedback design leads to a lack of learning. 
This should pull you up a skill loop. You should be increasing in ability, getting better at something. This is fundamental to games. You should get better at something. And if a game doesn't do this, it is going to be boring because neither curiosity nor mastery will be elicited and therefore no dopamine and therefore no high, no fun. In other words, games are training tools. Games are better at certain kinds of teaching than teaching is. Because teaching tends to rely on just crystallizing rote facts. And crystallized intelligence is fantastic, but games are about building cognitive schema. They're about building habits and routines that you can run throughout your life. So it's no accident that all mammals play in order to learn the basics of survival. In some sense, games have been around longer than humans have. Now, we tend to think of games as those sorts of things. And hopefully you've played, how many of you have played a game? <laughs> uh, yeah, you've all played a game. Everybody's a gamer at some stage in their lives. But these characteristics that a designer puts into a system can also be found in any number of other systems that are out there in the universe that have this required degree of complexity, that offer sufficient feedback, that allow us to gradually increase up a skill loop, right? All of these things let us do that, and it's no accident that in the English language, and actually many languages, we use the word play for all of these, right? Language is often wise that way. So, needless to say, Wikipedia is one of those ludic systems. But I am going to basically question you as to whether or not it would be a better one if it were intentionally designed to be one. So let's think about the first game of Wikipedia, which is to read it. Wikipedia does a little bit to encourage a learning loop around reading, but frankly, not very much. You're probably told you need to go research something for school. You're told not to use Wikipedia, and then you go use it anyway. Right? Wikipedia gives you an article. Wonderful. There's a lot of links there. Oh, crap. And you're mostly getting better at clicking and reading, right? The process of reading Wikipedia is not structured like a syllabus. Easy articles don't have an introductory reading level, and then the deeper links lead you to more complex concepts with a higher reading level. It's actually sort of arbitrary, right? If you search for aspirin, you're probably going to find the word analgesic in the first paragraph. And if you're in third grade and you just wanted to know what aspirin is, you're out of luck, right? So the game of reading on Wikipedia really doesn't give you very good scaffolding for learning. And it isn't teaching you to be better at reading encyclopedias. It isn't teaching you to be better at parsing content. And that's fine. It's just not something you ever really thought about. And that's not really surprising because everybody in this room is an autodidact. Every designer of Wikipedia is the kind of person who, like me, read an encyclopedia and a dictionary when they were eight for fun. And that's fine, except that all the other kids thought we were weird, right? We are, in the sense of we are not the norm. We are not the median in that, in that way. So uh, unfortunately, what that means is that structurally, you're set up to lead everybody back to philosophy, right? Famously so, um, which probably isn't the right end game for that third grader who wants to know about aspirin. So the game of reading actually does leave a little bit to be desired if your goal is to encourage the dissemination of knowledge this is a matter of concern. Now, notice I say if your goal is the dissemination of knowledge. I know you state that it is, but I'm going to argue that you actually have multiple different goals in mind at all times, and it's part of the reason why today there are many questions as you start doing statistical analysis of what's going on within Wikipedia. Part of the issue is that you have many missions and you're not really all pulling in the same direction on any given one of them. Well, let's talk about the next one. 
which is to edit. None of you are editors. Sorry. I'm sure there's some of you here, maybe, who are attending and learning how to use Wikipedia. I saw tweets from people who were in the sessions about learning the basics of markup. But really, you're here. You're not editors. Editors aren't here. Okay? You guys are in. I'm talking about the people who are not yet in. As has well been observed a whole bunch of times, low-hanging fruit has started to run out, right? Um, what can the typical editor edit? Justin Bieber page, right? And they try. It is hard to add content to more complex articles than that. We just have to be realistic about that. Think if you play any game, you work your way up increasing challenge. The increasing challenge in editing Wikipedia is that you have to know real world stuff, right? You have to actually become a scholar in a field and work your way up from simple edits to more complex edits. Edits are like monsters. They have hit points. Some of them are easy to kill and some of them are very hard. And the key question here is whether you are assisting users in working their way up this. Um, you know, by the time you get up to the boss monster edits, uh, you have to have true real-world expertise. And oddly enough, if you actually have true real-world expertise, Wikipedia actually discourages you from doing those edits because of the nest of policies around original research, around expertise, about citing oneself as a source, and so on. So you're actually capping the, the progression path here. And the only way to, you know, how do you become great at editing? Well, you go get multiple PhDs. That's, that's your end game as a fantastic editor. In practice, what do people do? They switch tracks. We all know WP Bureau is a lie. It's a lie. Because there is one fantastic game that probably any of you who are senior at Wikipedia have learned to play very, very well. This one. Right? The game of being an admin, a senior editor, a member of this community is actually shockingly rich. There's tons of rules to learn, full of cool WP acronyms to memorize. You learn how to apply them. You learn how to use rhetorical persuasive devices on talk pages. You learn how to um, discuss things with people, arrive at consensus. There's a whole pile of very applicable real world skills that happen in here. And you increase in power because we all know that newbies never get to ignore all the rules. Right? It's, it's you senior folks who get to do that. The success of this game is evident by the fact that we are currently attending a gaming convention for this game. Now, I'm not denigrating this game. Uh, it's obviously vital. And you're not playing it for yourselves alone. It throws off benefits in any number of ways. But I do think we have to face up to the fact that an enormous amount of Wikipedia infrastructure is built around this game in ways that serve you, right? Very directly. And we'll talk a bit about that. Now, let's look at tuning these games. What is it that we really want? Right now, you're always gonna get newbie readers, right? You don't even really need to try very hard. They're being thrown at you um, through external incentives. That said, there is clearly lots you could do to change this from being a game about clicking into a game about learning, if you chose to. You'd almost certainly have to start taking an editorial point of view on how to best teach things. And that might be anathema, but good teachers know that you do have to do that in order to get a point across. So if you decide that this is a game you want to change, that might be one of the sacred cows you have to tackle. These games are supposed to chain. If you get good at reading, we want you to graduate to becoming an editor. But right now, getting good at reading has zero pathways into becoming an editor. That is not how you graduate into this new role, about which more in a moment. And finally, you have the gardening game. The gardening game that is shockingly rich. You learn so many different skills as an editor, 
right? It's a master class in categorization and ontology. You learn about data structures. You learn about human relationships. I mean, it's just fantastic, right? Which is wonderful. But in practice, migrating from that casual editor, which, as you know from your own statistics, bounces a heck of a lot of the time, into being an admin, again, there aren't really very many good paths. In practice, your supposed advancement chain looks like this. You're missing the arrows. Now, this could be fixed, but you have systemic issues as well. This is a game with consumable content. How well will, would World of Warcraft work if when somebody killed a rat, it was gone forever? And yet, that is what happens when you catalog all of human knowledge. It starts being gone forever. And pretty soon, you have the fact that you are cataloging faster than humans are creating knowledge. Not data. Creating data at a wonderful pace. We are not, however, creating knowledge faster than you can catalog it. So all the good newbie monsters are extinct. There are some monsters that you could tackle, but unfortunately, they seem to be invisible to everyone in this room with a certain set of chromosomes, which is unfortunate. So what do people do in response? Well, you are currently driving them actively to create Fancroft, which you then delete. Because that is the only path available to them. Even further, you have a fundamental issue with knowledge. This is a space, a possibility space. And the fact is, the borders of this space are pits of subjectivity. And because of that, you will never walk up to the edge of the border. You cannot write an advanced article in any field without engaging in original research. Because if you are on the cutting edge, you have to make a judgment call as to whether or not it's actually valid. So you never actually go to the cutting edge. And so that means you have a finite territory. And of course, the people who are living at the cutting edge can't post, which is why I don't edit on Wikipedia. I have more success in posting on my blog and then having people use that as a source. Now that I'm SPS, which I didn't used to be, so I got deleted all the time. So you actually have quite a lot of issues with your core game loop for being an editor in Wikipedia. And I would argue that this is part of why you're wrestling with the question of whether or not you can get new editors into this system. This doesn't mean that's necessarily a problem. It's an observation. However, it manifests culturally as well. I'm sure many of you have these badges. Yes? How many of you have one of these badges up here? You do. Oh, oh really? So few of you? <laughs> well, here's the thing. This is the closest I can find to self-evaluation of the Wikimedia community as to the roles you serve. Humor and art are a wonderful window into a culture. This is the art of Wikimedians. This. And it actually displays some rather disturbing tendencies and attitudes towards those who are not already in the in-crowd. They're kind of snobbish, mildly sexist, and there's a lot of discussion of, well, they're just not in the in-crowd because we haven't taught them how to behave properly yet. Right? Again, humor often does this. It's okay. But self-examination should be about, gosh, is this what we want our art to say about ourselves? Is this what we want to be the badges of honor for our society? So what does that mean? High-end editors are gardeners. They are tending. That is what you tend to do, tend the garden. But that means that to editors, you are actually a new class of monster. You're the orcs, and your little automated bots that come along and wipe out everything that people do, those are the dire wolves and they're ubiquitous, right? And that's okay, as long as you realize the typical newcomer sees you as a barrier, not a helper. That is the role you currently serve in the ecology. Games have faced all of these issues before. Every single one of them. Which is good, because that means I can try to offer you some possible solutions for these problems. So, the first one you're gonna hate. 
Most games do not allow the admins to play the game. You would be restricted to only tending and we would bar you from editing. Right now, you are actually taking most of the easiest, best editing jobs. Fixing vandalism using one of your cool automated tools is one of the easiest things you could give a newbie to do. You even have a cool dashboard for it. And it's fun, people tell me they get sucked into the flow of it. And guess what, as a newbie, I have no idea that exists. You've hoarded it to yourselves. The sense of culture. Culture comes from consensus and is enforced by consensus, but it's usually imposed in advance by fiat. That's actually how that works in human societies. That's sad, but if you wanted to change things like your badges for your wiki fauna, somebody would have to actually say, look, we need our badges for new players to seem as badass because we want a new player to feel like a badass. We want the new people coming in to feel special and valuable, not like a puppy, right? Somebody should impose that by fiat because your consensus is not leading you to it. Player class issues. In terms of not so much how you see the importance, but really the infrastructure that is present today for these different roles, I would argue there's piles of infrastructure for reading, mostly in the form of articles, so that bar doesn't go nearly as high as it could, right? Because it's not in the form of educational scaffolding, it's just in the form of content. You have very little for the casual editor. You've tried, but in practice it's all invisible to them, they don't see it. And you have an enormous amount of stuff for admins to do and play with and, and learn from. One hypothesis of Wikipedia could be that Wikipedia is for the dissemination of information, and you should be spending far more effort on that and making Wikipedia better to learn with. That's a hypothesis, it's a valid one. You are not currently consciously executing on that hypothesis. It's happening despite you. A different hypothesis is what you want to do is not have people simply be learners. You want people to be community members and contributors to the culture. I see this, ex this is expressed via all your rhetoric surrounding Wikidata. That is actually a different hypothesis than reading the encyclopedia. And I think it's also a perfectly valid one, even a natural extension off the first one. But you have to decide what is your hypothesis, what is your mission, what is your approach. And further, you need to examine what exactly are the roles that you want people to play in this ecosystem, and how do you graduate? Relabeling can be incredibly powerful. If everybody at this conference thought of themselves as mentors rather than Wikipedia administrators, a lot would change about the culture of Wikimedia. This is what you want. You want this graduation path. You want people to be moving up this ladder. And that means you should be building in systems of interdependence where active mentoring takes place, where active assistance takes place. The highest calling of an expert Wikipedian should not be racking up edits, which is your current favored metric of importance. It should be how many new learners have I created? Because if that is your mission, that is how you should measure yourselves. You are what you measure. That is what you become. And if you measure by edits, you're putting the emphasis on the wrong end. Right now, admins spend an enormous amount of time creating content for other admins. A casual editor has no idea what a wiki project is. What would happen to Wikipedia if the casual editors the minute you showed up and registered, you were, set, you were given a survey. It was, these are projects that are out there. What, about, what of these do you know lots about? How can we recruit you in? I will spend an hour on Skype with you in order to get this project going. And why can't you lead it as a new editor? Why are you guys taking the fun bits, right? Give the fun back to the editors. It's not that you haven't tried. There is Wikipedia adventure, there's tutorials. You've tried all of this stuff. 
You just haven't gotten married to the idea in your hearts. And then, of course, those tutorials actually tell the editor that all the things that they believe are within their grasp, they're not allowed to do, which is a problem. You could mitigate the need for real-world skill. This is actually what the Wikidata minigame is doing. All of these are classic techniques that games use. Um, they're all probably uh, self-evident, except perhaps sidekicking. Sidekicking is where you take a low-level player, somebody with little knowledge, and you bring them along with you on a high-level task, and they are pro to protected, insulated from danger. So let's say, for example, that you found a new editor who didn't know the ways of Wikipedia, and you took them straight into the most controversial AFD there is, but took them under your wing to teach them how to do it so that they never felt crushed by the weight of WP asterisk everything, right? You have a content exhaustion problem? There are ways to deal with it. Games have dealt with all of this. You only currently deal with it through the elder game, which is to say specialized orthogonal gameplay of adminning, which is not the same game as the main path up, right? All these other three are open to you, but all of them are going to challenge your, your deeply held beliefs. So in that spirit, I can't assume that the lack of editors is actually a problem. It might just be that your project is 90% complete. If this were a game and I were looking at the usage curves, I would say, yeah, now's about the time that you stop getting new users. That is the norm. The game is fading out and becoming static. It will become a museum piece. That's okay. People will tend the garden forever, but the architecting is over. That's actually a normal step. It's up to you to decide whether that's the state that you want to be at, right? So maybe you're finishing up. If you don't think you're done yet, solutions are actually obvious, easy. You're just not gonna like them. So please don't stone me as I attack these preconceptions and, and kill some cows in front of you. If you want to have more content for newbies, you should encourage vandalism. There's nothing easier to do than fix vandalism. So you should sponsor vandals so that they come in because the easiest way to have people continually building a brick wall is to blow up some of the bricks every once in a while. It's antithetical to what you believe in, but it's obvious. Have a deletionist holiday. Delete 10% of Wikipedia. <laughs> Boom. Here's the thing. This is what Britannica did at every revised edition. There's even precedent. It's not as shocking as it seems. <laughs> Encourage things to be broken. Become less diligent. Let things get messy. Let it be an English garden instead of a perfectly tended one. Then there'll always be weeds to pull. Make articles expire. Just have them just fade and die. It got old. Wipe it, make people have to write it anew. There's lots of ways to add newbie monsters. You just have to be willing to give up on some cherished ideals. Your other choice is to actually add to human knowledge. Not data, knowledge. But that would probably fall under original research. Plus it's really hard. So probably not worth doing. You could lower your bar, encourage fancraft. You know, once upon a time, scribbling about Shakespeare on the Wikipedia of its day was Fancroft. Once upon a time, we felt that way about Van Gogh. Nobody in this room can say that the brony pages aren't going to be equally significant in 500 years. You just don't have the position and authority to say that. It's awfully hard to see what's consequential from this close. Lenny Bruce. Right? I mean, it's easy to find examples. Consider the value of subjectivity. This one baffles me. Wikipedia, fantastic. Keep it as objective as possible. How about midway down the article, you have a, a visible, thick, bold break, and you say, everything below this line 
is now increasingly subjective. And then you link to Wikia, which you run! <laughs> okay, which you used to run, and which does what you do. How's that? It adds to human knowledge. It's just not the threshold of knowledge that you currently believe is valuable. But you know what? If somebody starts at a Wikipedia page, you are currently encouraging to click out to little footnoted sources, all of which are as subjective as Wikia is. So what's the difference? Wikia is original research. <laughs> so is the book by that humanity scholar that is in your footnote, right? This is about credentialing more than anything. So why not embrace the fact that human knowledge is messy that way? Instancing is a pretty common tactic. Why don't you just fork every article? Every article that is controversial, just have two, three, four, five versions of it. Put it at the top. This article is controversial. If you would like to read the Marxist interpretation, go here. Each one can be as objective as it can be within its frame of reference. You're already doing this sort of thing with languages. You all know how disparate the different versions of the encyclopedias are. You are already forking Wikipedia in radical ways. Why don't, why don't you just let people do that within one language? Further, in the spirit of safe spaces and the panels that are happening as we speak, what would happen in terms of diversity, increased point of view, if you had an alternate Wikipedia that was a safe space? I bet you'd discover all kinds of new articles that nobody ever thought to put on the main Wikipedia. Because different points of view add to human knowledge. My point here is, these are here as challenges to you, because many of these run contrary to established policies. Many of these run contrary to even what people think of as cherished ideals. My sense is you have operated under a clear mission that was driven by a consensus formed when the world was different and your project was at a very different stage of evolution. Now the world is changing out from under you, circumstances are changing out from under you, the project itself has reached natural maturation stages. Maybe you need new missions and new projects and that's why you keep inventing things like the photo project and the wiki projects and wiki data and so on. As a community you have discovered, oh we need to start doing other things because the thing we have been doing isn't quite working in exactly the same way that it used to. I don't think that's an accident. I think that's a very natural process. But all of these questions should be very, very pointed for you. None of these have an easy answer. If you think they have an easy answer for any given one of these, I would suggest to you that you need to do more self-examination because Wikipedia, want it or not, is going to be the substrate for an Internet of Things database. And guess what? That Internet of Things is going to work more like a social network. And you're going to be saying, wait, but we're not a social network, but my toaster is going to be friends with my fridge, and they're both going to have Wikipedia articles, and, you know, this stuff is coming whether you want it or not. So the heart of the issue really is, you have been adolescent. And you have been the parents. You have been great parents. You've done everything you can. But the world is growing up in some new ways. Kids need to be let go. This is what you have been. This is kind of your mission. There's a whole lot of people who are out there building this right now. Are you this? It's a valid question. It's okay to say no. But you've also got this other possible answer that you're exploring with Wikidata. And that's, it's a possible valid answer. It has interesting implications that maybe you haven't thought about enough, right? Because after all, the people who are going to steal your work and lock it up in proprietary databases might really not be signing up to much of the Wiki, uh, Wikimedia mission statements. Right? So are there things you could do to try and maybe nudge them further in that direction? I'm sure there are. You have been both of these things. 
but not to the same person at the same time. Your low-level editors have not been in the community. Your community has been broadcasting. That isn't really what you thought you were doing. Your readers are really outside of the community right now. Maybe that isn't what you want. If you want a community of knowledge, there are design things that you can do to encourage it. Fundamentally, what I'm saying, that everything that you've done till now, which has been incredibly hard, incredibly laborious, and I applaud all of the work, I literally use Wikipedia every day, thank you. But it's been the easy part. This has just been the easy part. And the hard part is deciding. Where do you go from here? And it's going to take real clarity. Thinking about who do we want our readers to become? Who do we want our editors to become? How do we help? And the best thing about this community is that idealism. You are all in this to help. So all of this is just advice on how you can help more. Just remember to have fun while you do it. That is a huge part of why you stay in it today, right? And all serious work deserves to be fun. Because we denigrate fun at our peril. It is one of the fundamental things that make us human. So keep it fun. And um, may your consensus always be keep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raf.
Hello, and we are back. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Yanir Baryam. He is the founding president of the New England Complex Systems Institute. His research focuses on developing complex systems concepts and applying them to diverse areas of scientific inquiry and to major social problems. His extensive list of publications includes the textbook Dynamics of Complex Systems and Making Things Work. Please welcome Professor Yanir Baryam. Thank you. Are we going to get the slides? Hi, good morning. Actually, you can turn down the volume a little bit on the mic, I think. Can you do that? A little bit lower? All right. Okay, so good morning. So, um, so today I'm going to talk about human civilization, which is a big topic, uh, but I think it's an appropriate topic for this conference because Wikipedia, as you're all aware, is playing a major role in civilization. And so thinking about what's happening with civilization is, is important both for understanding maybe where Wikipedia is and also uh, potential uh, contributions and changes in the future. Okay? So um, let me just start with a couple of words about complex system science. Since um, uh, this is, many of you will recognize from the matrix. This represents streaming numbers, which are the world as data. Um, and if we were going to do an analysis of something using traditional statistics, we might take two of these, sorry, this clicker is a little bit, okay. Um, two, we would take two of these time series and we would correlate them with each other. And uh, if we wanted to study something else, we would take two other time series and correlate them with each other. But in complex system science, um, we have, boy, we, jumping, um, we study the system across all the data. Um, actually, if you don't mind coming and helping me with a clicker, because it seems to be stuck here. Maybe you can just take the, la the laptop. I don't know if it can be moved over. Okay. Just, uh, I think, the, the forward arrow. Let's try it and see if that works better. Okay, so go back one, yeah. So we take time series, we take all the data and we study patterns across all the data. And that enables us to ask different kinds of questions and uh, obtain different kinds of insights. Um, and what I want to do is next talk about civilization. Um, and um, one of the things that we are often talking about today is globalization. Uh, globalization has to do with interdependence, how things depend on each other. So go ahead. What the, I'm going to talk about interdependence. This is, then I'm going to talk a little bit about complexity and what complexity is in this context. Then we'll talk about organizational structures, and finally I'll spend a little time talking about Wikipedia. Now, when we go ahead, so when we talk about the interdependence globally, one of the things that has been clearly about interdependence is the financial crisis. So the financial crisis cascaded across the world and we've been studying the markets and all kinds of aspects of it. Um, another area where we see a lot of global behavior happening right now is in social unrest. Um, there's a remarkable amount of social unrest now going on. Um, and what I wanna do is I wanna pick a particular thread of what's going on, next and start here in Tahrir Square um, a few years ago uh, and with the events there and across the Arab Spring and talk about it. So let's go one more and ask why did it happen? Go ahead. Um, and the common answer that people give is that there were bad dictators. But these dictators were around for decades. Um, so why now? And a better answer 
is shown in this figure. So the black line is an index of food prices that's put out by the UN, it's basic foods. So this is relevant to poor populations worldwide. The red dashed lines are food riots and the Arab Spring. And the manifest connection uh, was uh, pointed out in a report we submitted to the government at the time of the blue dashed line, which said high food prices, social unrest, political instability. That was four days before Mohammed Bazezi started things off in Tunisia. Now, it's not really surprising that food prices are connected with social unrest. I don't think anybody should be surprised by that. Um, but these are global food prices, and these are social unrest in many different places in the world. And this is manifesting the global food supply, which I've just indicated here. This is the exports and imports of wheat, uh, with the exporting countries shown in blue and the importing countries shown in red. And the fact that food is a global resource is relatively new in the last few decades. So that's an important thing to know about. Go ahead. Now what I want to do is show you food prices from earlier, starting from 1980. Let's just watch it. So the more recent period that I showed you earlier is quite different than what was happening in the decades before that. And therefore, there really requires an explanation. Go ahead. Go ahead. So we addressed this in an analysis that we did. Um, and we analyzed all kinds of factors that people were talking about, like um, uh, droughts or increasing meat consumption in China, um, uh, exchange rates, energy prices, all kinds of things. But what we found was that there were only two factors that were really important. And once we just included those two factors, we could uh, explain the price behavior directly. So the blue line is now the data and the red is the theory based upon just two factors. One is the effect of corn to ethanol conversion in the US. And that, the effect of that is this blue dashed line that goes up to the right. Today, over 40% of US corn, which is a major producer of corn and exporter, uh, is now going to fuel that is used in cars instead of gasoline. And that's determined by government mandate. So it's a decision by the government. The other effect which gives rise to the peaks is speculation on commodity markets. So these are bubbles and crashes due to trend following, people buying and driving the price up and then selling and driving the price down. And together they give the total food price behavior. Now the causes of the speculation are two. One is deregulation of the commodity markets that happened in the year 2000. And the other one is the financial crisis. Go ahead. So this is a combination of a bunch of curves. Let me just point out how that works. The inverted triangles that are uh, yellow-green um, represent mortgage prices. So they crashed in about 2007, and then shortly thereafter, the green shows the crash of the stock market. And then there is this whole set of peaks here and included here are wheat and corn, silver and oil, commodities. Why would wheat and silver have the same behavior? So it's really hard to understand from a supply and demand analysis why this would be the case. It's also hard to understand why they would peak after the beginning of a recession, i.e. the stock market crash. The natural explanation, however, is fairly clear. When the mortgage market crashed and the stock market crashed, people needed some place to put their money. So they moved it into the bond market and into the commodities markets with the other two big markets. The commodity market is small, and so the prices were driven very rapidly up 
just based upon the flow of money. Okay? So what's happening? What we see that's happening is that there is a cascading effect. There's a mortgage crash, there's a stock market crash, there's a commodity peak, and then there's riots and revolutions around the world. Tremendous cascade of interdependence. And that is happening till today with the, um, uh, the Arab Spring is the second peak over here. These are simply oscillating bubbles and crashes. Um, and the tremendous amount of suffering in, uh, because of high food prices is resulting from this. Go ahead. So that is showing uh, Tahrir Square and peeling back several layers of cascading causation. Next. So interdependence seems like a really bad idea. It caused these cascading failures of the system. And indeed, in some ways it is. But I want to now step back go ahead, and, and talk about interdependence more generally and introduce the idea uh, in a fundamental sense and use three sort of paradigmatic examples, a material, a plant, and an animal. Go ahead. So if we ask about a pitcher of water, if we pour some water out, and we ask, does anything care? Well, go ahead, the water in the pitcher doesn't care that the pit water was poured out, and neither does the water in the cup care. Go ahead. What about the plant? So if we lop off some pieces of the plant, go ahead, the pieces will probably die, unless you treat them very carefully, right? The rest of the plant, however, will probably keep growing. Next. What about this animal? What happens if we lop off a chunk? Infection and death, yeah. Be very unhappy. So both the part and the rest of the animal, go ahead, uh, will be strongly affected. Now this is to do with interdependence, right? How the parts depend on each other. So we see that the material has very weak interdependence. The plant has a stronger interdependence, an intermediate case, if you will. And the animal has a very strong interdependence. Well, this raises an interesting question, which one is better to be like? Right? Go ahead. So, I don't know if you had a choice or if you want to think about it, what, what's a better kind of choice? Is it better to be a material, a plant, or an animal? It's not so clear, right? Well, the world, go ahead, from what we've seen, is behaving like which case? Okay, shout it out. Animal. Surprising a little bit, right? Civilization is looking like an animal um, because if we poke it in one place, somehow the rest cares. And we've seen that recently with events in Ukraine, Iraq, and so on. And what about this last one? Someone anywhere in the world can edit Wikipedia and influence the rest of the world in terms of what they see and learn and read, right? Somehow that's a higher level of interdependence than we've really been talking about so far. So this is where we need to switch language and think a little bit more deeply about the nature of what interdependence is about. Um, and the right terminology is complexity and that's what I want to talk about next. Go ahead. So the question that I want to pose is how complex are we, collectively, civilization? How do we think about that? Well, in order to do that, we have to answer this question, what is complexity, go ahead. And rather than starting with civilization, let's just take the Earth as an example. How would you describe the complexity of the Earth? Well, so there's a key idea, which is that 
oh, I'm sorry, this is something that you're concerned about, many of you here. How long is a description of the earth? All right, if you were gonna write a description, how many characters would it have? That's a key idea in terms of complexity. So how long would it be? A few paragraphs? A book? A lot of books? Well, we could turn to some online encyclopedia I know about. Go ahead. And count the characters in the article about the Earth. But, ah, go ahead. What about all the articles that have something to say about the Earth? So there's a problem with an encyclopedia in this context which is that the article length are limited by the patience of the readers. I don't know, does anyone want to make them have more patience or less patience in terms of the articles? But I want to answer this question fundamentally from a scientific perspective. And it's clear that there's something missing because the length of a description can vary tremendously. And how do we think about that? What we need to do is to add an additional concept, go ahead, which is to realize that the length of a description depends upon the level of detail. So here we have two pictures of the Earth. The one on the right may not be quite recognizable, but up there, that dot over there, I, I'm told is the Earth, uh, taken presumably from a Voyager uh, when it was farther away. So depending upon the level of detail, uh, we need different amounts of information to describe it, and a picture is a kind of description, as would be words, to capture these, the, the meaning of these pictures. Um, so how do we discuss this? Go ahead. And the answer is there is a, an idea which we call the complexity profile. It's the amount of information necessary to describe the system as a function of the scale of resolution. If we have more detail, there's more information. If we have less detail and larger scales are the things that we describe, we have less information. So the, the case on the right might be you know, a paragraph describing the orbit of the Earth, and then the book might be describing uh, tectonic motion and some meteorological stuff and so on. And, and well, the lots of books, you'll figure out what, what it's describing, okay? With me? Good, next. So in general, the largest scale stuff is about the sort of the movement of the thing as a whole, and the fine scale is about, you know, sort of all the detailed structure and the motion of the parts. Next. Uh, for those of you who are technically oriented, there is a quantum mechanical uh, relevance here. If you go to the absolute finest scale, any physical system has a finite amount of information necessary to describe it because of quantum mechanics. Uh, and that's shown over there, but we're not gonna be concerned about that. We're gonna be concerned about large scale behaviors. Go ahead, thank you. So what I wanna do is switch and talk about organizations and how the nature of organizations affects their descriptions. Go ahead. So, this is a complexity profile of people working together. Go ahead. Conformity, uniformity, all doing the same thing. Got it? Okay, next. Go ahead. This is about people doing different things. Okay? This is my research team doing a cameo appearance here. Go ahead, next. And so, um, in general, we can construct a complexity profile based upon how much are doing the same thing or conforming and how much are doing different things. Next. So the green curve represents things that are doing the same thing and the blue curve things that are doing different things and the red is sort of a combination. Go ahead. Go ahead. So if we were to talk about a material, and this could be a material, it's stuff that's going the same way would look like the green curve. Each one doing different things is the blue curve. Go ahead, and well, something that has different kinds of information at different scale is the red curve, next. For organizations, the green curve, uh, uh, 
say, a Roman legion. All of the people marching together doing exactly the same thing for a long time and all uh, repeating it uh, in terms of what they're doing at the same time. Next. Uh, people down at the mall, each one concerned about their own thing. That's the blue curve. And some kind of coordinated system where there are a few people that are coordinated and other people are doing other things. Next. So here's a question for you. Why is complexity important? Why do we care? So I want to take a step sideways and talk about this for a moment. Go ahead. So I'm going to talk about this. Just I want to show you these two images. This was part of a research project studying. Uh, can you turn down the microphone a little bit more? Because I'm hearing a lot of echo. Thanks. So these are images of the housing of elderly individuals. This was a research designed to study the difference between people's homes and planned congregate housing. If we look at these two images, which one is more complex? The one on the left. Visually, it's more complex. And if you want, you can think about elderly individuals in their homes, or if you want, you can think about yourself. What happens if you're in a really, really complex environment? How does it feel? Overwhelming. Overwhelming. What happens if you're in a really, really simple environment? Boring. So, this says something fundamental, and there's a, a name, a law associated, it's called Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety, which says that you have to match the system and the environment complexity in order for the system to be able to manage. Too complex environment, the system cannot survive. Is that clear? Good, next. So we want to be matched to the environment or to the challenge, and that makes complexity have a very, very concrete, real-world meaning. Okay? Next. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to talk about social organizations again, but from the point of view of organizational structures. Okay? Because we talked about conformity and we talked about differences, but the way things are done in society is you have organizations and there are processes of control that take place. And I want to talk about that. And we're going to use two examples, the military force that we already talked about, ancient armies, and I'll talk about factory production. Next. But I want to talk about in the context of the traditional paradigmatic social organization, which is a hierarchy. It's been around for a long time. In a hierarchy, if you want to talk to your neighbor, you can't talk to him. You talk to the boss, and the boss talks to the neighbor. If you want to talk to the person down the hall, you talk to your boss, he talks to his boss, the boss talks to the boss of the person's down the hall, the boss of the person down the hall, and he talks to the person down at the end of the hall. You got it? Okay. Next. What I want to do is think about what the hierarchy is for in the context of military force. So here we have this Roman legion marching long distances. What is the hierarchy for? And the answer is telling them where to go right, where to go left, where to stop, etc. Next. What about for a factory? Factories are more complex. Everyone's not doing the same thing. Different people are doing different things. The fact that they're doing different things enables them to make more complex things, like cars or refrigerators, right? On the other hand, each person does the same thing over and over again. That gives you large numbers of cars. That's scale. Okay, so we have more complex than the Roman legion, but still large scale. Got it? It's okay? Good? All right. 
What does the hierarchy do in this case? So it does a couple of things. It decides whether they're going to build cars or refrigerators. But it also does the coordination between what they're doing. So that requires more complexity of the hierarchy, right? Next. So if you think about this for a little bit, what you realize is that the hierarchy intuitively is there in order to control the collective behavior of the system, not necessarily what every individual is doing. But there's an underlying issue here. So in modern terms, this is a bandwidth limited system. Right? Because if anyone wants to communicate down from one end of the organization to the other, they have to communicate up the hierarchy and then back down, right? Well, that individual up at the top has a limited bandwidth. There's only a certain rate at which they can communicate information. Is that clear? So this is a limitation, and the limitation is the following that the collective behaviors of the system cannot be more complex than the communication ability of the individual at the top. Is that clear? Anyone want to nod? You, can, is that clear? Yeah, OK, good. Next. So today, organizations are not typically hierarchies. Um, they have a lot of lateral communication. Right? I want to talk about on the left the hierarchy and on the right another kind of system which is a network. Now we haven't really talked about networks and how to understand them, but you can think about them maybe as the network of the neurons in your brain or something like that, right? Where it's pretty clear that the collective behavior of the system can be much more complex than the complexity of one of the components. Now, this hybrid structure in the middle has a lot of lateral communication. But here's something that we can say categorically. To the extent that one individual is in control of the collective behavior of the system, to that extent, the collective behavior of the system cannot be more complex than that of an individual. Is that clear? It's a tautology, right? To the extent that an individual is controlling the collective behavior of the system, to that extent, the collective behavior cannot be more complex than an individual. Clear? Good. So the next step in this discussion is to think about history. What is the process of change of organizations? In order to get there, what I have on the left here is a figure that represents Ashby's law of requisite variety. It's the vertical axis is the complexity of behavior of the thing, the entity, the organization. And the horizontal axis is the complexity of the environmental demands of the system, on the system. And what Ashby's laws tell us is that we better not be below the diagonal. Right? If you're below the diagonal, then your complexity is less than the complexity of the environment. You're finished. Clear? We don't have to be above it. Anywhere along the diagonal is fine, because then the complexity of the environment and the complexity of the organization match. Now, if we think about history, what we realize is that over time, right, militaries compete with militaries. And Corporations compete with corporations. So what happens is that over time, if one becomes more complex, then that increases the complexity of the environment for the other ones. So this creates what's called a red queen's race after through the looking glass, right? So you have to run fast in order to stay in place. And so what time is is an arrow moving up and to the right. OK? So organizations are becoming more complex, causing the environment of organizations to become more complex, causing the organizations to become more, you see it? OK. Now, I've also drawn the line, which is the complexity of an individual. That's the amount of information that an individual can communicate to other individuals. 
What happens when the arrow of time reaches that line? What happens? It stops going up. So that's one answer. But it's actually not quite the whole answer. Something has to stop going up. The individual dies. The individual dies. Ah! No. Hierarchies fail. Right. Why? Hierarchies fail because hierarchies cannot have more complexity than an individual. But that's not true about networks. So networks can keep going. In fact, they can keep going a long way. Right? So I'm going to claim that this has something to do with what's happening in society today. It has something to do with the fact that distributed organizations are happening. So that we have to be about at that point. In fact, we're past that point. Next. But here's this sort of sequence of history. We started out with hunter-gatherer societies, which were small, and there was no big behavior at all. Then we had ancient empires, right, like Rome and others, where you had big, large number of people in armies, where you had many slaves, you know, you had road, you know, the roads of Rome or mining operations, all large scale. Then we went through the Industrial Revolution, fast forward to that, and we created smaller branching ratio hierarchies in order to control more complex organizations, okay? And then we went through this hybrid structure, and we're somewhat a little bit past that point on a historical level, and we're often running toward this global networked civilization. Next. From a connectivity perspective, we went from isolated small groups to larger connected groups to more connected and more complex groups and then to this connected civilization. Next. So I'm going to claim that the actual transition point can be nailed down to the 1980s. It's already a few decades ago. Probably most of the people at this conference weren't even born yet. I remember it. <laughs> what happened during that period of time was dictatorships, many of them switched out. They, they, they stopped, you know, countries with dictatorships swapped to democracies. Um, Soviet Union collapsed, remember that, some of you? But Interestingly enough, it doesn't stop there. Corporations underwent a major transformation due to the introduction of management practices like total quality management, re-engineering the organization, and all kinds of other such terms. And the reason, why would they be needed? And the answer is clear, because the CEO couldn't tell everybody what to do, and so they needed ways of creating distributed decision-making processes. Decisions had to be made without the CEO. So let's drive this home a bit. Let's take a classic system which is, you understand as being distributed. Let's take the food supply to the city of London. Think about what would happen if you tried to centralize that process. Think about all the different kinds of food, the produce and canned goods and frozen goods and refrigerated goods and whatever else. Think about the different modes of transportation, the trains and planes and trucks and etc. Boats I left out. Think about the different places it has to go. Supermarkets and restaurants and institutions where food is being served. Okay? What would happen if you tried to centralize that? Yeah, people might starve. It was tried. Where was it tried? In the Soviet Union. And in the Soviet Union, if you walked into a supermarket, there would be about 100 different kinds of food. Seriously. And the quality was poor, there was a lot of spoilage, and the availability was poor. So it was really hard to get people the food that they needed. Okay? So what we've learned is we've learned a couple of things, and I want to summarize these two things. 
Number one is kind of surprising. Go ahead. Civilization doesn't simplify the scale of civilization. This is not the same as ant colonies or flocks of sheep. We are together a single entity over here. Over on the right here is one of my uh, students, bright guy, very uh, good guy. His name is Alfredo, so he's playing a cameo here. He's one of my students. And um, he's a good guy, but this thing over here is more complex than he is at the collective scale. That's an important statement. It's a single organism. Next. The second thing that we've been talking about is the failure of central control. And as a matter of historical reference, uh, economist Frederick Hayek in the, about World War II said in a book called The Road to Serfdom that central control of economic activity was basically a failed approach because of the complexity of economic activity. What we've figured out is that it's a much more general problem than that. It's not just economics, it's more generally collectives of individuals have to behave more complex than an individual, and therefore central control fails. Next. So when I've been talking about this, I've been doing this for about 20 years, um, I have been talking about this idea, that the traditional ideological battle between democracy and communism which many people think has been won by democracy, I claim has not. Um, that we are moving to this complex organism which is quite different in its concept and its manifestation. It is not about a vote which creates a representative that is centrally controlling decision making. It is about collective decision making and collective action. Next. And here's the point. In the past, and in the origins of Wikipedia and other such systems, it has been surprising that distributed organizations function at all. I claim that in the future, it will be surprising that anyone tried to centrally control systems. Because complexity has to, can, and probably will continue to increase until it's much, much higher than the complexity of an individual. And therefore, centrally controlled systems will be left behind. Okay? Next. So that's about civilization. A single entity, which is very complex. We as individuals are no longer the entity on the stage, so to speak. It is us collectively. And by the way, interacting with this community over the last few days, it's remarkable how complex the community is and how it interacts collectively. Dramatic. Next. So what can we say about Wikipedia? So I want to say a few things. These are all very preliminary. There's just some thoughts over the last few weeks. Well, I should say I've thought about Wikipedia before for many years but in a concentrated way over the last few weeks. Next. Here's the basis of the conversation. The basis of the conversation has to be this matching. Organizations have to match the complexity of the challenge. It's a very important statement. In order to be successful, an organizational structure has to match the challenge, the structure of the challenge in scale and complexity. Next. So what's the task? Well, you know it better than I, but let's say it's a compendium of knowledge organized in a particular way for now that immediately presents us with already a conflict in this discussion. Why? because there are two different parts of this statement, one of which is complex and one of which is large scale. What's the complex part? The content. What's the large scale part? 
the structure, the format. Is that clear? The format which repeats itself across all articles, the things that are uniform across the system, those are large scale, whereas the content itself is complex. Next. So the content is complex is quite clear, I think, as a whole. Even traditional encyclopedias didn't have one person write the encyclopedia. We, I think it's fairly clear that that's impossible. But I think that Wikipedia has also demonstrated that even individual articles benefit from multiple contributing authors. Fair? Fair. And that suggests that complexity already exists at the level of the individual article. And the format, however, is large scale because it is uniform by its definition. Next. So in a traditional hierarchical organizational for encyclopedias, the editor was responsible for several tasks, deciding on articles and selecting writers, performing edits for the format and publishing it. And remember, publishing was producing many, 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 many copies of the same thing. Large scale requires a particular time to be finished and all that stuff. And therefore, it required central control and benefited from central control. Now, the internet enabled the last piece to be set aside, so to speak. And Wikipedia took advantage of this to further to take a tremendous step and enabling, quote, anyone, and anyone I put in quotes because there are some, some uh, uh, limitations on who can do this in terms of skills. Um, but in principle, anyone to create articles and edit which means by our analysis that a much higher complexity is possible, but also it meant the challenge for the large scale aspects in terms of creating uniformity and conformity. Is that clear? Great, next. So this leads to a tug of war um, between centralization and decentralization. Centralization for the purposes of the conformity and decentralization for the purposes of the complexity. Next. Now, what I want to do is not address this question directly. For those of you who were here before in the talk just before the break, I think there was a discussion of some of these issues that was more direct. I want to do it a little bit indirectly by introducing a different language. And I think the language is incredibly important uh, as a way of thinking about Wikipedia as well as other systems today. And that is evolution. Go ahead. Go ahead. So evolution in biology creates these dramatically complex and capable systems. Amazing. We can't do this yet. Not near to be able to do this. Um, the other statement is that evolution is always a work in progress. And that's a really important thing which I think resonates with Wikipedia. And I want to talk about evolution as a framework for thinking about this a little bit more. So, the major really, really successful systems today, almost all of them are distributed through a mechanism of evolutionary dynamics. I've put some of the examples here. Markets, which we've mentioned. Um, the second example might not be familiar to you. So Visa and MasterCard are what you have in your wallet to pay things sometimes. In fact, possibly most of the time. Um, they together account for more than $10 trillion in transactions globally, which is way over 10% of the global transactions that are taking place altogether, and that's been increasing over time uh, smoothly. Um, the reason why you're not aware of them as an evolutionary system is that the evolutionary process takes place at the level of the card issuers. There's a nice book, if anyone's interested in, in reading it, in reading about this, it's called The Birth of the Chaotic Age by D. Hawk, who is the founder of Visa International and I think presents some of the ideas in a very uh, strong way. But there are other systems that you're very familiar with, the internet, open source, Wikipedia, as uh, you all know, and more recently, app communities. So how are these systems structured? So first of all, there's some framework 
It's a centralized framework, in the, or it's, it's consistent across the system. But that framework enables individual actions, which are distributed. And they combine into collective behaviors through the mechanisms that we often associate with evolution, persistence, or heritability, with variation, selection, with competition. Now, I want to point out something. A lot of the words here are contradicting each other. Centralized with distributed, individual with collective, persistence with variation and selection. These things are contradictory. They really are. And they coexist in this system. And, and the fact that they are paradoxically coexistence means that there are some choices about balance and trade-offs that one has to understand. Now, in order to think about this, we have to map Wikipedia into an evolutionary process. And there are different things that one might talk about. I think many people are concerned with the evolution of Wikipedia as an institution. I'm not talking about that right now. What I'm talking about is evolution of pages in Wikipedia. So what we want to do, I want to map it onto evolution. So let's talk about evolution. The standard evolutionary dynamics that we know in biology is we have a set of organisms. They reproduce, creating more of them. And then there's some selection process. There's a variation uh, that can take place, which I've included. And you end up with different things happening later than you had at the beginning. Is that clear? Next. So this doesn't look like that. But this is not, I think, really what happens in editing. Next. I think it, so this would look like just variation, 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 clearly not evolution. Next. So the way I think that we should think about it, and I don't think that this will surprise anybody, is that the key step is the reading and then the deciding as to whether to edit, because that's a selection process. So if there is a, an edit, say a primordial edit, then the next editor reads it and then either accepts it or rejects it, i.e. reverts it or edits it again. And this process incorporates within it selection and the alternative, right? It's a selective process. So we can map this onto an evolutionary dynamic. Go ahead. There's an issue that we might be concerned about. The issue that we might be concerned about is there's a lack of parallelism, right? There, in biology, we have many, many organisms at the same time. Here, what we have is we compare with prior versions, right? Everything competes with previous versions. A and that's not quite the same. Now, it turns out that mathematically, in some sense, this still puts this within the category of evolutionary dynamics, as far as we're concerned. Um, but what one really might be concerned about is the extent to which the evolutionary dynamics does what it's supposed to do. And that is an opportunity for analysis, and I'm not going to do the analysis here, but I want to talk about some of the things that evolution needs to accomplish. Next. So this is, um, so what I'm plotting here horizontally is a set of different possible organisms or a set of different possible pages of Wikipedia, uh, versions of the same page, okay, set of different versions of the same page. Upwards, I'm doing some measure of quality, fitness in biology, it, which is uh, uh, defined as well as quality in Wikipedia, which means to say probably not well at all, but that doesn't matter. It's whatever quality you care about for right now, that's upwards. Um, and we have this particular version here, and the problem that often happens in evolutionary dynamics is one gets stuck at a local optimum. This is not just in any time you have complex entities, they're going to have local optima. And what we want to do, go ahead, is to jump to another one, which is better. The problem is that we can't tell how. We can only take small steps. So we have a situation where if we take a step, we're going in the wrong direction, in the wrong direction in terms of quality, though it may be in the right direction in terms of where we want to go, but we don't know that. 
So if we immediately select, we will get stuck. And this is a problem. This is a problem in evolutionary dynamics. This is a problem um, in any kind of process that involves incremental changes that are trying to make improvements in something. So what we would really like to do, go ahead, is to take some set of steps, go ahead, go ahead, and end up in the other one. Now, if this is a problem for this case, go ahead, if we look more generally, we will see that it really looks like this. There are all of these local optima that are separated by deep valleys, and this is generally the way the world is. You don't have the control over this, sorry. So if you don't have control over this, how do you solve the problem? And the answer is that we need balance, go ahead, of different processes, particularly divergence and convergence. Divergence is about brainstorming, right? That's what we do in creative processes. And then convergence is about decision making. Clear? So we need divergent processes balanced against convergent processes. I don't know, I like this terminology, diconvergence, but let's go on to the next one. Now, here's the point. It's not exactly a balance. Because balance suggests that they kind of are happening at the same time. And it may turn out that that's actually not the best way to do it. It may be better to have a period of time, like a brainstorming session, where you do your divergence. And then afterwards, you do your convergence. Is that clear? And how much time you spend in one or the other. What happens if you do too much divergence? Say it again. Coming back may be difficult. And in fact, in the limit of too much divergence, you end up random places. Right? You'll end up in, a, in, a, in, in, in entropy. What happens if you have too much convergence? Yeah, you get stuck. Stasis. You're stuck, period. So the balance is really important for any kind of progress. Go ahead. So um, if we go to people, then we actually turns out that there is a, a, a division of people that was pointed out by a colleague of mine, Ernest Hartman. There's a book he wrote, Boundaries of the Mind. He studied people and he said there are two kinds. There are thick boundary people. The thick boundary people says everything has a place and everything is in its place, right? And the thin boundary people are open to exploration and, and, uh, and uh, experience. So we also need a balance of different kind of people. Yes. And we need a balance of automation in people. Automation is something that tends to work on which part of the system? What? The structure. The large scale part, the stuff that has to be done over and over and over and over and over again the same way, you can automate that. Can you automate the complex part? No. Some might say yes. I claim there's a legitimate debate as to whether or not people are fundamentally necessary for complex tasks. And I think that in the meantime, that's surely the case. Next. So what does the framework look like? And I mean, I, I think, that, to be honest, I think Wikipedia understand this. I mean, I don't think I'm saying too much new. I just, I think I'm giving a language for discussing the nature of the balance and the main nature of, of where we are or where we might want to go. Um, but the basic statement is that you can have central control of the framework. That's fine. You may not choose to, but you can have that. That framework has to create this evolutionary context. And the key thing is it rules enable rather than restrict. So let me say a few more words about that. Go ahead, because rules turn out to be a really key part of the difference between control and evolutionary processes. In a controlled system, rules are about what to do and what not to do. In an evolutionary system, rules are fundamentally enabling and selection is the process that creates the improvement of what is going on. Next. And rules are white and black. And selection is recursive. It's fundamentally recursive. 
it's not about where you are, it's whether you're moving. And that's really an important difference. And so I said evolution is always a work in progress. Evolution is always changing the organisms around us. You may not be noticing it because they're changing slower than you might like or expect dynamics to take place, but they're all the time changing. It's a recursive, fundamentally recursive process. So what are the rules for, and in general I just want to emphasize this, and again I think this is quite understood in, in Wikipedia, um, that rules are about integrity of the system and the protection of the participants so that they're part of the system. Um, there's another thing, however, that's really important. Rules are often about promoting change rather than preventing change because very often systems go to stagnation. So you have to protect against that. And the time scale issue I've talked about. So evolution is a conceptual framework, it's a formal analytical system where we can make it into a, a way to analyze what's going on. And that's an opportunity. So what do I see in terms of future? I hope that uh, this framework will help in the dialogue about what's going on about with Wikipedia and what Wikipedia wants to do. Uh, but really, the, the eventually, going back to the beginning of this, human civilization is a complex collective. You are all part of it. Wikipedia is a very important part of it today. And the way that Wikipedia develops in the future is clearly going to influence in a strong way the nature of its contribution and what it can contribute to civilization. That's a tremendous challenge and opportunity. Next. So among those things are many people are talking about expanding. And remember, so Wikipedia already, Wikimedia, Wikipedia already serves as a foundation for many both conceptual and pragmatic distributed systems which would not have been thought of before. This is part of the transformation of society that we see around us all the time. And there are clearly other new opportunities that this can be applied to. But the second thing I think is also really important, and I know that you're aware of it, but I think it's important to emphasize that Civilization is not standing still. This trajectory of complexity increase is going to continue. And so every system around us is going to be challenged. Absolutely every system around us is going to be challenged. And when you see the dominoes fall and the governments fail and the all kinds of things happen, I told you so. Okay? I'm not kidding. Um, but everything, even the systems that are distributed today, have to continue to transform. And that's incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, well, eh, what do you think, community? Let's take some questions. <laughs> Let's take some questions. Go ahead. All right. So the question is, there are certain environments that are more enabling of creation of networks than others. And yes, indeed, that will be the case. Um, again, the, the challenge that we face, and this is a very interesting thing, is because of the environment being complex, you have to perform something. And the reason that you have to perform is actually because of the fact that everybody else is changing what they're doing. And so you have to also change what you're doing. And that's what makes the need for creating these networks. OK? Yeah.
<laughs> Best practices. Okay. Okay, so the question is, right now we have a system where we have some decentralized organizations, but they're interfacing with centralized organizations, and the two don't speak the same language and have a hard time with coexistence and survival in this context. And, and, and the answer is that we are in a process of dramatic transition at high speed. And um, there are gonna be a lot of rough edges um, and the frustration is, of course, very high, I think, in this context. Uh, and people don't understand, and they, and, and, and by the way, the fact that you have a distributed organization doesn't mean that it will succeed. It's not every organization will succeed regardless. But um, distributed organizations will prevail. And figuring out how to get the existing, the vestiges of the system that don't understand distributed organizations to, to make room is a key challenge. I don't think that I can tell you how to solve that right now, but I can tell you that I understand its existence. Yes, you had a question. What kind of cognitive aids would we need to understand distributed organizations, which we're not able to right now? Yes. So first of all, one of the messages that I've emphasized is that there is a degree to which we cannot understand. And that's pretty surprising. I mean, there, there's a certain humbling, right? which says that you, know, you want to figure it out, right? But you can't, and that's okay. Um, at the same time, the conceptual shift is really important because what's the knee-jerk reaction when a system doesn't work in the old school approach? The knee-jerk reaction is to put someone in charge. And that's going to fail. So I don't know if you remember this, but 9-11, immediately afterwards, there was a commission that was put up to analyze the intelligence community failure in the United States. And the recommendation of that commission was to create a czar of intelligence. Since when are the czars examples of good governance? Okay, but that was the answer because their reaction was put someone in charge. So we have to think about it differently. For me, I've tried to communicate to you these ideas because I think they are very powerful. The ideas of complex system science help. And they help us not only to understand the need for distributed control, they also help us to understand what structures support distributed control, like evolutionary dynamics. Um, but ultimately, I really do think it's important that we realize that we don't have to understand them fully in order to be part of them. And some balance of understanding the role of knowledge and the role of uncertainty is important. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, if the members of the uh, virtual community roundtable could come down. I believe that is you. Is uh, I'll join. Go yes. sit over there, please. Uh, and then I will turn things over to Aaron Halfaker. Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'll just take a second quick to let everybody get up to the stage here before I get started. Can you guys see Eric on the way over? 
Oh, well, so we might skip his. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, this roundtable is intended to gather the, the invited speakers for today from this, the, the keynotes, to discuss virtual communities in a more general sense and to engage each other on ways that we can think about them. So before I get started, I should introduce myself. I'm Aaron Halfacre. I'm a Wikipedian who builds tools. I'm also a research scientist working at the Wikimedia Foundation. And uh, as is my uh, privilege of being the chair of this panel, I get to say something to you first before we get started. So I study the nature of online communities, and I specifically focus, of course, on, on Wikipedia. And I would argue that understanding the nature of things is, is critical. Um, I'm preaching to the choir here. Knowledge is important to us. You know, and it's important to us because it, I mean, it's our mission, but it's our mission because it's powerful. Knowledge is very powerful and everyone should have access to it. So what I'd like to argue is that understanding ourselves, our community, our technology, it, it's important. And for a similar reason. It's important because with it, we have the power to improve to do more, to understand our problems, to take advantage of our opportunities. So end of the rant, on to the panelists. So first, I'd like to do, introduce Mark Peltier. Uh, Mark is uh, the operations engineer at the Wikimedia Foundation responsible for Wikimedia Tool Labs. He works at the strange intersection of a long career in system administration with over a decade of involvement in the Wikimedia movement. His primary role is to be the interface between the community of developers working in and around the projects and the technology that support them. Raf Kosser, if you didn't see his presentation earlier, is a game designer, though he does a number of things related, including speaking, writing, consulting, and so on. He's worked on pretty much every sort of game, from tabletops, console titles, Facebook games, etc. But he's best known for his work with virtual communities of large-scale games such as MMOs. Uh, he's been a creative executive at Sony and Disney, and he wrote a book called The Theory of Fun for Game Design, which is widely used in the fields of game design, education, training, and gamification marketing. So we were all just here for your year's talk, but I have this bio and a few people might have just walked in, so I just want you to know who, it, who is here. So Yanir is the founding president of the New England Complex System Institute. His work explores the origins and impacts of market crashes, global food crises, ethnic violence, military conflict, and pandemics. He's author of two books, a textbook, uh, Dynamics of Complex Systems, and Making Things Work, which describe the use of complex system science for solving problems in healthcare, education, systems engineering, international development, and ethnic conflict. Brandon Harris is somebody that we all know because he's been on the front of Wikipedia. Uh, he's a senior designer at the Wikimedia Foundation. If you know Brian, you'll know what I mean when I say that he's made of steel wool and whiskey. He used to work in games, but over the last four years, he's primarily been working on Wikimedia projects. And, oh, we don't, oh, we do have David. <laughs> David escaped the University of Oxford to become the head of technology and advanced learning at the University of Arts in London. His work explores the relationship between learning and technology in the university context. And he also works to improve our understanding of how learners engage with the web more generally using his visitors and residents paradigm of online engagement. And sadly, we don't have Jake, Jack. Um, but we do have Jonathan Morgan. Jonathan Morgan is a research strategist in grant making and learning and evaluation team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Jonathan's research uh, Wikipedia is an interesting phenomena in and of itself. Specifically, his publish published work has addressed discussions around controversial article topics, the evolution of Wikipedia's policy environment, new editor socialization, and wiki projects. He's a designer of the, the Wikimedia, or sorry, the Wikipedia Tea House, a maintainer of Hostbot, and a wiki gnome on the English Wikipedia. All right. So before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about the format of this presentation. So we have about 60 minutes here. 
and we're going to start off with a panel discussion that's going to last about 40 minutes. Uh, and I'm going to—I pulled in questions and topics that our panelists have asked to talk about from the wiki page to uh, try and get us engaged in talking about some of the things that they're going to talk about later today or have already talked about earlier this morning. And with the last 20 minutes, we'll engage in a question and answer session where we'll ask you to ask the panelists. So, with that said, let's get started. So, the first question that I'd like to address the panelists with is the challenge of what is a community? And if you'd like, you can turn around. I have some follow-up questions here. Um, and with that, who would like to take on this challenge? Brandon. This, I, I gave a talk about this exact same thing in Wikimedia, Wikimania Israel. Uh, identity plus conversation equals a community. That's, it's, it's very simple. Once you have a shared identity or you have, in, you have individual identity, you can have a conversation in a shared system, you have a community. Anything beyond that is, is when addressing. Hmm. And now he's going to come out. Well, well, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to give a drier version. How many of you are geeks, math geeks maybe? Um, to me, speaking in a very pragmatic sense, when I try to architect communities, I think of them as denser clustering on a social graph. Um, uh, with said dense clustering coefficient really caused primarily by the common interests, common geography. Um, fundamentally, they're, they're susceptible to being analyzed and worked with in that way. Uh, and uh, they also, that also gives you concrete specific metrics for the other questions on the screen. Uh, so it's a very useful tool. I guess I would just I'd, I'd plus one both of those and, and also throw in um, common goals um, and, a, and a, a mutually agreed upon set of kind of rules of engagement or social norms. Um, personally, I think I would add a caveat to that definition. Um, I don't think it's a question of so much sharing an identity or sharing a, a sense or a geography, something like that, but having the perception that um, that is shared. And this, in fact, is probably one of the biggest causes of conflict, is when you find yourself in a group with whom you thought you shared something that made you part of this group, but in fact you don't. So it's a question of perception uh, rather than one of, of actuality. And perhaps that's less measurable um, than some might think. And it's one of the things that I think, especially in the um, uh, weak media movement, has had effect, um, that people believe we're all working on to the same direction, we share this movement identity, but in fact it's a lot of fragmented little bits that are playing sometimes tug of war with each other, because while we had this idea that we were a single community, in fact we are not. So it, it, it really, we need to temper, I think, this by saying that it's what you think you are part of that creates the communities, and not what you can measurably say that you are part of. You're underestimating measuring. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's actually shocking how much you can measure about exactly that. Um, in the MMOs, we could literally track every single interaction you had with any other individual in the game, down to the level of what kinds of things you said to them, whether you waved at them, whether you engaged in a commercial transaction with them. We could tell who liked one another just from looking at that data. So I, I actually, one of my metrics for a healthy community is the fact that not everybody is pulling in the same direction. A monocultural community is by definition unhealthy and fragile. Um, a robust community has internal tensions, has multiple central nodes. A community that is oriented around a single strong individual, for example, is extraordinarily fragile. And we've actually seen companies use that identify who are core leaders of a community, invite them to come join some new organization, and dismantle the old one as an attack. And <laughs> so uh, there, there is actually a fair amount of, of theory that suggests that health is driven by the conflict within the community, not by everybody pulling in the same direction. So you're, you're basically saying that like the grind against each other is what makes the entire thing strong. And if, like, if, the, if there's a way that you could wedge into it, it's just going to fall apart. But yeah, if you have single points of failure are bad, yeah. and, and monocultures are susceptible to infections, I guess is the way to put it. <laughs> yeah, 
But um, in an MMO, you've got leveling up, you've got this structure, and so there is this sort of shared underlying overall narrative, you know, and there might be shards or different elements to that, but nevertheless, there's this backbone to it. Whereas with something like Wikipedia, there's, there's this axiom about, you know, putting together the whole of human knowledge and in putting that in front of everybody, which, it, which is kind of, it, it, it seems like such a great thing to do that nobody talks about it. And I wonder if that's one of the challenging things in terms of community is, is actually the route to get there might be varied and perhaps that isn't, because you were essentially saying that a community is, uh, thinks it's got a shared goal, but it's probably best if it doesn't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's, if it's best that they don't talk about it, um, but perhaps recognize that there in fact are a number of distinct roles um, and distinct goals that may be allied with each other. Uh, for instance, I'm pretty sure that everybody here has a different definition for what exactly is all the knowledge and what exactly it means to have, share it with all the world. Um, and recognizing those subgroups, I think, is beneficial rather than, than saying there is a community, say we've got a cluster of communities and then foster those communities as opposed to try and, and, and say, well, we've got a shared objective, this is a community, and is it healthy, is it not healthy? I think that if we're asking the question at the wrong level, we're going to get answers which are ultimately meaningless. So I wonder if I might wage a challenge for this um, in the discussion of communities. Um, and that's the last question that I have up on the, the slide right now, which is, how has technology affected uh, what a community is, or has it? Well, it's definitely made it easier to create larger ones. Because mm. communication, you don't have to be physically present. You know, you have uh, old days, your community was like your small village and the people that you were riding horses to. I mean, now we can be all over the planet with a 7,000 millisecond delay. And uh, I mean, that's, that's a really big change right there. It's made it easier to find your tribe. And, yeah. Um, that has been wonderful for people in small communities who had no peers of their tribe. Um, you know, so many examples, right? Um, the single person who wants to dance ballet in a town of 30 somewhere in a rural place or whatever, right? Uh, and it's wonderful for those people. The downside, and I think it's, a, 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 it's actually, I classify it as a, an existential risk, <laughs> uh, I, I think it's that big a downside, is that technology has encouraged monocultures, has encouraged uh, polarization of opinions, has encouraged uh, filter bubbles, communities that only talk to themselves. I think the critical part about having multiple communities inside of a larger framework is that it's critical that each group recognize the important contribution that the other groups offer, even if they don't understand it. Right, so our society would be impoverished if there were no, I don't know, for some reason telephone sanitizers is coming to my mind because of Douglas Adams, but um, <laughs> you know, if our, our society would be impoverished if there weren't people doing things I know nothing about and don't appreciate and don't care about, but it's important to appreciate and care about those things and recognize that the tensions from subgroups are because everybody is contributing in their own ways to the whole. But the internet, gosh, really likes to work against that. It really likes to make you think that your monoculture is all there is um, through recommendation engines and, uh, well, I could tell all you all kinds of horror stories, but you can just go read about it because it's been well studied. So based on the, the talk that Ymir just gave, I'd like to ask, um, for, for communities, can you have a centralized community? Do communities have to be distributed? So, so uh, can you hear me? I don't know if my mic is still on. Yeah. So, um, actually, let's start by taking two examples. How about the city of London as a community? Or the city of New York? Take a, a different kind of example. How about a sports team? Um, you know, I mean, these are, their community, I think, when it's trying to uh, get at something which has to do with common interests or common goals, um, but I think that the nature of collectivities is, is broader than that definition. I think that people do different things for a community, sometimes even if their goals are opposite each other, and not just that they uh, differ in opinion. 
Though I do think that diversity, I think the conversation about diversity is really important. I think one of the things that I did talk about is this complexity profile, which is consistent with the remarks that uniformity is not healthy under most circumstances, unless you're a Roman legion, um, in which case uniformity is very important, in fact, essential. Um, so I, I, I think that I think that we should expand our thinking about what it means to work together in community. Um, I've tried to say that we are all part of the same community, um, but I think that there are lots of things that one can learn by studying parts of us, i.e. parts of the community. We um, uh, did a study of, of um, uh, social media where we found that, in answer to your question about technology, um, we found that people seem to segregate in groups that have interests according to scale. So there are people who like to interact with other people in the same city. And there are people who like to interact with people in the same country. And then there are people who like to interact with other people who are anywhere in the world because they care about global things. I, I do think that understanding the communities that we are made up of is a really important thing, and, and the role of shared goals and shared identity is crucial. And um, Hayward Alker, who's a, a, a very important sociologist, uh, talked about the role of historicity, how we share perspectives on history, because different groups have different views of what historical facts are important. Uh, their own stories of origin and the perspectives of t on time. Um, but I do think that more generally, whether we are a sports team or whether we are a city or whether we are a community, I, I think there are lots of ways that we work together in order to make things happen that are not the trivial form that we often look for. Mm -hmm. So. I, I'd like to riff on that just a moment, um, and uh, well, and, and to, to move on to the, the next the next question area because I think it, you know, it kind of feeds into this. Um, the power of code and algorithms uh, has the potential to to do a lot for communities that operate in virtual spaces, and so I'd really like to ask you guys to to riffing off of that last question, the last slide, you know, specifically of technologies, what do code and algorithms? Uh, how do they affect a community? What do they provide a community, and how can they, you know, damage a community? Um, I think I have an interesting remark on that, um, and it's actually uh, more a quibble about the way you phrased the question. You said specifically about technology, and I think that's not a helpful distinction in itself. Um, if you look at Wikipedia, for instance, you look at all the processes, all the rules, all the the the. Um, bureaucracy um, that has been put in place by the editors, by the users, um, those are code. Those are also algorithms. Um, whether any particular facet of that process is being performed by a machine or by a human is pretty much sorry, irrelevant in the grand scheme of things, in that there is this process where human contribution eventually filter down into an encyclopedia. You're talking about, you're wanting to broaden the question away from like say just code and stuff and then bring it into like systems themselves. And I, I think that you're, that's a very astute way to think about right, it. Right, because I, think I don't think that, that we the need line, to talk about. where the line lives at any one point um, is flexible. And, and one of the things that I've, I've harped upon a lot is that the distinction between who is a coder, who's a developer, and who's a user, <laughs> and who's an end user um, is getting all the vaguer. Um, and uh, Eric this morning just said something on that topic about templates. Uh, in Wikipedia, we have templates which are almost entirely code, but which are then actually managed mostly by content writers. So that, that line gets blurred. So I don't think that if we're asking code and algorithms from machine is a useful distinction. You need to look the entire at the entire system. One of the things that I, uh, something that I'm going to talk about later, but I really like the um, concept of the ignore all the rules rule, okay? And I think that in, in it's your favorite rule, okay? 
but occasionally you ignore it and use the rules, yes. right? <laughs> so I, 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 and I think that what happens in terms of the question, if it's just about coding in that digital sense, is that a community will find ways to appropriate platforms to their own ends. You know, they'll always, you know, I don't want to Jeff Goldblum it, but, but nature finds a way. You know, the street um, finds its own use for things. Yeah, and so I, I think that it would be, it would perhaps be wrong to imagine that you can limit, or I, I suppose to a certain extent, you can limit and control the way that a community operates um, by by you know hard code in that sense. But generally speaking, I think a community will find a way to appropriate the tools that are available to them to do what they want to do. Yeah, I do think, I, I mean, I agree with all of this, but I do think it's important to realize that to a teenager in high school, a social construct feels like a law of physics, right? Um, and it certainly might be the law to us, you know, a law might feel like a law of physics, but it isn't, right? And code can have the force of a law of physics. Like, it, it, depending on how it's implemented, it can literally be something that you... you it's, it's a physical barrier until changed, right? Um, and a lot of people may not be empowered to change it. So I always say that we, in building any kind of virtual community, we design it either by commission or omission. Yes. Right? Because it, there, there are patterns that they will fall into as a result of the absence of pieces of code, right? <laughs> and so it, it, it leads to the problem that you know, as you're, you are setting up some laws of physics, and even if they later go away, they often leave behind the imprints of culture, for example. Um, so you, you're, every choice you make, including the choice to not make a choice, is actually making a decision about the shape of the community, often in ways you can't foresee, because none of us are that expert at predicting what people will do. Speak for yourself. That's a really important point. microphones. Not sure. Yeah, there we go. Um, I, I think that one of the one of the uh, changes that uh, code makes in the nature of a community and the interactions within a community are that it actually, um, I mean, it increases because we don't we don't control the laws of physics, right? There are many things in the in the physical environment that we don't control. There are things like like social constructs, like rules, like laws, um, the built environment that we do control. But within a uh, within a, uh, a virtual community, um, uh, it was the, the environment that people are interacting with was all ultimately designed by somebody. Um, whether or not the, the, there, are, you know, there are obviously unintended consequences of these designs um, and people reshape the environment as they use it. Um, but I think that in general, one of the, one of the effects that code al and algorithms have on the function of an online community is ultimately it increases uh, the responsibility of the community creators and the community designers and their, and their accountability, their culpability for the health of the community because ultimately all of this is, is constructed. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a really, uh, I mean, it, it just occurred to me, but a perfect example of the kind of law of physics that applies to Wikipedia that uh, is, obviously it's built on top of the web, right? And most particularly, it's actually, it's, since it's built on the web, not the internet, it is most specifically built on asynchronous protocols. And everything about Wikipedia is shaped by the fact that it has a presumption of asynchronous interaction, right? Even though it's not necessarily, I, I mean, it would be trivial to make it <laughs> synchronous these days, but nobody's, nobody's chasing after it in that way, right? It's just there, it's a law of physics that is also now a social construct, even though you could replace every edit box with something like Google Docs, where everybody's editing in real time. Think of what that would do. Wikipedia would just go, wow, <laughs> right? But one of our developers out there is trying that. <laughs> well, this is the second one of my things you pimped your talk in. We're going to have words. Yeah, but uh, all I'm getting at is that, you know, it's, it's very easy to be blinded to the assumptions of the laws of physics because it's like, well, of course things fall. You know, it, yeah. apples fall. That's how the world works. Uh, I mean, we, you can see, when, when we study various uh, ways, especially the Wikipedia community interacts with each other, um, we actually have found that one of the problems, especially surrounding like kind of the harshness that people feel 
uh, when, in, when they first join the community um, or the, uh, the overall uh, negativity that some people may walk away with is because uh, the community either, because the, the software itself does not provide for easy ways to say nice things to people but it does provide easy ways to say mean things to people. So uh, you can ban somebody, revert them, and say you did bad. Uh, you did bad, you did bad, you did bad. But only very, very recently have we added things that said you did good. You Thank you for this. And um, it, it's my belief that, that a lot of software, software in and of itself, can affect a great deal of social change. So if you were to say, uh, in a comment box, you're going to leave a message to somebody. If the message, if, the, if the, the, the text inside of it, the default text said, be nice, I mean, that's just a small, subtle thing, but it, it actually does put your brain in the mindset, as opposed to saying, like, you can be a jerk. Um, and, and I need to apologize, by the way. That was a joke that I made. Okay. Us, and we're friends. So, yeah. so actually, <laughs> uh, classic virtual community recommended go to any online community designer, and they will tell you never, ever, ever have a negative, rep negative reputation system. No, no, no. Do not have one, no. right? But uh, in effect, Wikipedia has one, not intentionally, but it has that effect. But uh, all the advice among practitioners is use positive reputation systems only. Negative will come out from a lack of piling up stars, right? Uh, uh, and Reddit. There's, there's reasons why. Reddit just made a major change to not show you the number of downvotes uh, on a thing. So it's only you ever see the upvotes. Now you could calculate it. I mean, if you were bored, you could figure out how many upvotes or downvotes a thing got. But the, the end result, and, and people were complaining about it, of course, because change of version, um, the, the end result was, is, is, is will be, I, I believe, that exactly what you said. Stuff that people don't like just falls off. Yeah, we, ha we actually have empirical, verifiable, results and there are math models outside of the virtual community field um, among economists um, that show that the amount of trolling, griefing, misbehavior, identity uh, spoofing increases when you have negative reputation systems because what it encourages is starting your identity over, wiping history, eliminating tracking, which encourages anonymity, which breeds vandals. So I mean, we, we have the math. So since uh, it seems that there's you know agreement that I mean it, it's at least interesting to intersect code and rules when we when we think about a system uh, like an online community, um, and that this can have a dramatic effect on people's behavior and how they see the the world. Um, I want to move on to the question of who has the power to decide right now in communities that are like Wikipedia, and who should. Eric Moeller has the power. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a very complicated question. Um, and, and clearly, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing right now in the, in the Wikipedia community because we are always at a strong tension between what the community thinks is the right choice for the software and what the foundation thinks is the right choice for the software and who has the ability to deploy or undeploy or make these decisions. You know, obviously there's the recent media viewer uh, kerfluffle. I, I'm going to use that word. It's like, feel like my grandmother. Um, I like that word. I love that word. Uh, you know, the media viewer was deployed and then a very small and, and let's be very clear, it's a small handful of people voted that it should be removed. And when they said remove it, we said no. Uh, because our data was different. We said we had uh, over 10,000 people who had actively chosen to use it, and the software was not designed for editors, it was designed for readers, and we wanted to keep it on there. So uh, it, it is a tension, and I think that it should be a conversation. It should always be a conversation. But at the end of the day, I think it's more about who has the 360 degree view rather than people who have like a smaller cone of light to see. Uh, I don't know, that makes sense? Yeah, I'm so much more cynical about this. Oh, yeah. Ultimate power is whoever has their finger on the power button. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm dead serious. So whoever can yank your server from the rack they own you. 
Whoever pays their power bill, they own you, right? I mean, it, fundamentally, the power is very clear and it flows. And in any online setting, it is, they, they're gods. You can't do anything about it. Um, and, and this has been a, a, a tension in online communities for a really long time. And it led me to advocate for, I, I had this in my slide and I forgot to mention it, don't use rules, think in terms of rights instead. Because the very construct of working in a digital environment is one with a very clear pyramid of power. And, and, and I mean, net neutrality is a perfect example of, oh God, we're subject to gods above us and we can't control what they're gonna do. Uh, rights is the better framework because it, it empowers in the opposite direction. Rules always go down. And so the more rules you pile on, you're just adding on to this pyramid of who controls you. It, rights work in the opposite direction. And it's much harder to do, but there's a reason why humans migrated towards that for, you know, countries. Yeah, so it sounds like we're just kind of relearning stuff. It's this classic thing of, hey, it's the digital, yeah. but look, we're stumbling around in territories that we've sort of already solved. And we just need to decide that when a bunch of people get together to try and do things, you know, this, is, this has been a challenging area that's been looked at before. So you, what you're talking about is that it needs to be a kind of republic in that sense. Uh, I, I've actually, uh, in 2000, I wrote a declaration of the rights of avatars. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I've been advocating it very literally for a very but long time. I, what I don't understand is how I think that, 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 that there's power in terms of providing the place where stuff happens, right? And then there's power in terms of that, the, the, the way that, that, that um, the, the capital that gets moved around in that place on a day-to-day -day basis, which has got to do with the, with the people in that place, if you see what I mean. So there's a difference there, right? There, so, there is so, a difference. The, the thing that's really interesting is that if you are the person who has your finger on the power button or the person who makes a profit from running the service or whatever that position of power is up there, the interesting thing is that by and large, good governance is profitable to you because you get, it, it means you get to keep providing the service. If you are commercially driven, you get to keep making revenue off of it. And in the end, we're unfortunately always beholden to somebody's commercial motive right now. Um, you know, be it a broadband provider or whatever. Um, and good governance turns out to be about politics. And that turns out to be in large part about people having a voice and a say. And yeah, it opens questions like, wait, you mean we should do things like enforce digital squatters rights in the opposite direction? And it actually leads you to those places. <laughs> yes, you should. Um, and, which is you know, an odd place to end up, but it's, it's a logical consequence. It just also turns out to be best business practice. So you're so, saying that Wikipedia should be run as if it was a nation? Yeah. Okay. It looks like Mark had something to say on this. Um, Am I reading right? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, it, it's interesting because um, for a number of years I've been an arbitrator on the English Wikipedia, which makes me um, pretty much the closest thing to some semblance of government. Um, and, and I do say semblance. Um, and even as an arbitrator, I'm arguably one of the more influential and most powerful um, contributor on the project. Um, the concept of, of, of a right seems a little odd. I mean, I understand why you're trying to draw the distinction between power and moral authority to exercise that power, but ultimately, um, there is an objective, there is a foundation that was created to shepherd that objective, and they're the ones with the power, the finger on the power button. And now I'm actually a member of the operations team. And I can tell you that there's not going to be a code change that's going to be deployed unless you manage to convince one of us that it's not going to destroy the servers, that it's not going to um, cause difficulties. Or you manage to convince our boss, Eric, obviously. I think you two are actually in furious agreement. Exactly. You just describe a governor. Yeah. <laughs> right, yes, but the rights, the idea that um, the, the end users or the contributors have rights, they, they have rights because we all agree they should. Yes. And not because they're enforceable in any way. Uh, they, yeah, you'll find that that's kind of a basic in political theory too. Um, the, the governed self-assign rights and basically force those who govern them to acknowledge them. 
and then the governors well, say, because, we're going to acknowledge it because we all get along better if we give you this much so that we can take what we want. But in, in, in quote unquote real life, in, in governance of nations, um, ultimately, the people who currently have the power can have it removed from them with, by people with sticks, if nothing yes. else. Yeah, but yes, and every Wikipedian right. could quit. That's, yeah, that's exactly what I was right the, right the point. You have the right, you have the, right to, the, the minimal right that any user of a, of, a, of a community has is to leave. And that's actually the biggest weapon they have, right? You can, uh, uh, the only thing that keeps people staying is because they want to stay. And if at some point or another the community or the governance of the community says, you guys, you know, screw you, uh, they'll just leave. And, I mean, in some cases, like in Wikipedia's case, it's like, well, uh, yes, we could force whatever software we want on there. We could remove the community's ability to modify core JS files or whatever. We could do all that. But we'd have such an exodus of users that it would probably be, you know, maybe a death blow. So it is to our benefit to actually listen and, and have a conversation. At the end of the day, we're still the governors, right, at the foundation, so we still have to like actually make that decision. That when brings I, up, go ahead. Well, as I say, when I, when I worked on, when I had my, my own MMO, right, when you change a rule, like uh, the, uh, the way the game was played, for whatever reason, to try to keep game balance. You change physics. You change physics. Yeah. Uh, the players would either like it or dislike it, and if they really hated it, they would quit. And then I would have to go like, okay, I got to figure out a way to make it go back, and and walk it back. It's it's the same. It's the same principle. That just sorry. That just uh, made me think about uh, revisiting kind of our earlier thoughts about what the difference between like online community and offline community might be. Is that um, people can much more easily vote with their feet uh, in an online community setting. Um, ultimately, you can just leave. Uh, and so uh, they're, you know, one of, the, one of the major phenomena, which is both a blessing and a curse of online communities, is the fact that people aren't necessarily as deeply invested as they are in, in, the, you know, in the governance of Wikipedia. Well, maybe people in this room are a bad example of that. But uh, many people who contribute to Wikipedia aren't as deeply invested in the governance of Wikipedia as they are in their own nation, in their own household, in their own city. Um, because ultimately, it, it's, it's where you live voluntarily. Not, it, it's not where you have to live, right? There's nothing keeping you from leaving. So I think this conversation has led us to a, a good spot to move on to the, the question that I, I would really like to ask you guys. Everything up to this was a warm up. Um, <laughs> what's the potential of wikis? And where, where have we actualized this? Where are we missing opportunities? And I invite you to think broadly about what I might mean by wiki. I, uh, I refuse to answer this question uh, on the uh, advice of my attorney. <laughs> Actually, a big part of this is my talk that's happening at 2.30, so ah. I really just kind of think I'm not going to spoil that for you. Let, let me say a few words about this. Um, when wikis came out originally, um, they became pervasive. I have several of them up on my system. Uh, we use them for internal uh, communication. We also spent uh, quite a bit of effort building a, um, uh, a system based upon the uh, Wiki Foundation um, uh, system for doing governance, for decision making, for eliciting a public participation in uh, collective decision making for uh, governance. Um, I think that it's become clear in the last few years, within very short periods of time, that communities of huge scale, hundreds of millions of people can arise from a historical perspective overnight. Right, within a few years, based upon very simple procedures for communication. Right? I mean, Twitter, right? 140 characters has become pervasive uh, in very short period of time. Um, I, I think it speaks to what's been talked about here as there is a huge importance of decision making about what to do because simple and small differences in simple systems that enable human communication are creating 
tremendous platforms for social engagement of all kinds that we know of. And I don't know if you feel this way, but I don't think that we've seen what's going to happen in the future yet, okay? Because there's a lot of opportunities. Um, so wikis have created one of the tremendous revolutions in social communication. And I, I do think that um, decision-making about what can be done or what should be done um, is important, but I'm actually quite agnostic about what is the structure of that decision-making process. Whether it's a particular person that wakes up one day and says, oh, I'll put this together and it becomes the World Wide Web. Or whether it's um, a carefully thought out negotiation between many people. I don't know what the right process is. But I do know that we've shown that very simple ideas can be transformational uh, because of how people interact with them. And I have one more comment about this. Um, I want to take exception with, I don't know, Ed around? Ed, Ed is here, so Ed who organized the conference. I, what? There he is, Ed. Um, I actually don't like the name of this session. I don't like the social machine's name. And, and the reason is it seems to put the emphasis on the machine, at least to my ear, and maybe that's not the way you hear it. Um, and the code question is related to that. I think that, take a step back and talk about the ideas of artificial intelligence and, and machines replacing people. I think that it's the same thing as the fear of, of steam engines replacing people that happened hundreds of years ago when, when power generation became possible. I think that we are discovering more and more that people are different from machines. Um, and, and I do think that thinking about civilization as mostly about people and as second of all about the technology is really important. So I think that the real opportunity that's available is not to think about the code, but to think about the people and use that to inspire us to figure out what it is that the code should do. And if we do that well, and whoever does that well, um, uh, will, I think, create transformations. And we've seen that it's possible for single, a single person to have multiple ideas that have been transforming society, right? Steve Jobs as, an, as a key example in that case. Um, but I think that we have continuing an ongoing opportunity to transform society. Uh, and I think that the community of Wikipedia, Wikimedia, has created, ha, ha, has, has made such a transformation. Um, and there's tremendous amount of more opportunity to build on it. Yeah, I, I, perhaps um, related to that, it's, you remind me of something that I can't articulate very well, but for some reason I've decided to start talking about it, is um, that I, I wonder whether, you know, historically with digital technology there was, you know, there were limits to it in that it would break, it would snap, it wouldn't scale, you know. And I think we're, getting, we're at a point in history whereby it, it does work, it does scale. If we can figure out what we want to do with it, we can make it happen. And I wonder whether, relative to a question like this and coming off the back of your point, um, the technology gives us opportunities that we are not capable yet, as humanity, of taking advantage of. It's like, it, it's almost as if it's, it's not outstripped us, obviously, because we've created it, but there's a potential there that we haven't quite figured out what to do with yet. So fundamental challenges in Wikipedia might well be a lot more to do with people than they are to do with technology. Um, I'm actually going to um, go on in the same vein. Um, I've always been an amateur of good science fiction. And good science fiction, interestingly enough, is about technology, but it's never about technology. It's about the effect that that technology has on people. And when you say, what is the potential of Wiki? I do not think about any particular piece of software. Um, I'm seeing one revolution there, which was um, 
a piece of software that enabled one thing, and this did this enablement that was important, that it erased the distinction between the provider of information and the consumer of information. Um, it suddenly websites weren't something that somebody gave you. It is. It, it became something that you would give each other instead. And that created a number of new dynamics. Um, perhaps I would say it reminded us of a number of very old dynamics instead. Um, but it is fundamentally, technologically, just a tool that causes big change in people. So when you ask me if what is the potential of wikis, I'm saying, I don't think that wikis in themselves have any potential. It's a new tool in our arsenal. It's a new tool in the toolbox. And it did change things in the way we use computers, in the way we use the internet. But the potential of wiki is just the potential of people. So regretfully, we're running out of time. And so we have to open the floor to question and answer. I actually am just going to answer your second bullet point there. Sure, if it can be quick. January 2012 when the SOPA blackout happened, we got the community together and we prevented the United States government from passing certain laws. And we did so by raising awareness. And we used our voice, which was one of the largest, and we were able to do so because we did not have a clear political agenda. We, we had a clear political agenda, but we had no financial motive. And that's a very, I think, a very important distinction. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the wiki that did that. That was the community that did that. Excellent point. And so with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions. So if uh, anybody has any questions they'd like to ask the panelists, then please raise your hand. There. Is, I, I'm going to assume this is in response to the remarks on negative reputation systems. Um, I, I want to make a, real dis a, a very clear distinction between having a bad reputation and a negative reputation system. So as, as a term of art, negative reputation system means a persistent accumulation of black marks upon a user record. Okay? It's, it's a very specific thing. Imagine um, on eBay you get stars. You used to be able to get, no, this person sucks. And what happens is, whoever gets marked as, you suck, wipes that record and starts over, and then is anonymous and not trustworthy. Um, that's very different and has almost nothing to do with dissent, right? I mean, you can dissent, and people can dissent, and people can have comments. The problem with quantized reputation systems when used in a negative way is they lead to, to identity management issues. They lead to, you know, they, they have very specific just, you know, execution problems. And it's in large part because downvoting someone isn't really dissenting, right? It's, it's this reductionist version of dissent. You know, they're not the same thing. And our problem there is trying to cram a very sophisticated human interaction into a yes, no bit. And it, it turns out it doesn't work. You can't do that. What does work, the reason the positive works, is because that becomes persistent trust markers. And it turns out that accumulating markers of trust is something that we do treat as human cultures. We do actually literally do it that way, you know, iterative tit for tat and blah, blah, blah. We literally pile up chits in our heads when we deal with people in a positive way. And uh, there's uh, you read up on the literature on gift giving, for example, or something, and you'll, you'll find that there's a very large tradition of it. So everything you said, absolutely true regarding dissent and, and all the rest, but if Facebook had a dislike button, which periodically comes up, right, oh, there ought to be I dislike person would be a very bad thing to have on Wikipedia, or this person has been blocked by X number of users on Facebook is a very bad idea. It just leads to account churn, 
falsification. Uh, yeah. So it, it, they're different problems, basically. So there was a question up there. I suppose that's me then. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the silence. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so that's the end of that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the way that I look at it is that, you know, we can think about open, we can think about the idea of the, the rhetoric of open. And I think let, let, let's, um, let's talk about a university providing a massive, massively open online on course. So th th there's one form of open whereby you say, um, Hey, here's all the stuff that we make, and you know we're going to throw it at you, you know, and and we're 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 going to be gracious enough to open our gates so that you can look at the content that we have, right? That's one form of of open. The 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 more sophisticated form of open, and this does relate to Wikipedia when you think about the difference between readers and editors in some ways, is okay. We're going to allow you to become part of the discourse, okay? We're going to invite you in, we're going to talk to you, we're going to discuss, and we're going to create knowledge, create and curate knowledge, okay? So I suppose, th I, I think the area that I'm suspicious of in terms of, of MOOCs is, um, is that they're open in, in, in the content sense, but they're not open in that kind of, we're, gonna, we're going to engage with you, we're going to converse. They're more broadcast than they are conversation, okay? It depends. Depends how they're constructed, yeah. But 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 you know, uh, a lot of them have that kind of drive behind them, and some of that's because we haven't found good ways of having conversations at scale. Um, and I, to, to be honest, having conversations at scale, I think that is the that is the challenge in hand. And if you like, and I think that that comes back to Wikipedia. Okay, so we can see that Wikipedia is great at saying, "Here's tons of stuff, world." Okay, but is not so good at saying, "Hey, come in and help us make the stuff." Okay, uh, or at least that mechanism is 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 a bumpy old ride. Uh, and so, how 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 can you make that conversational? I mean, at the moment, the what intrigues me is that the the what's traded within Wikipedia is edits, as you were mentioning, and uh, and I wonder if that 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 the, what there needs to be is is better ways of of, of of allowing discourse. And I know that there are, but perhaps that comes back to your asynchronous synchronous point. I don't know. So that's 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 what I gotta say about MOOCs. Okay. I, I so strongly agree about the scale issue. I do think it's important to realize that um, this has been an ongoing problem since the beginnings of oral culture. The issue of how to have conversations at scale is, is essentially the enterprise of human knowledge and has been from the beginning. And that it's important to use as touchstones the many accommodations that we have reached with that. I mean, one of the ways in which we have conversations at scale is voting, right? And, and there are mechanisms that have been created to try to deal with the problems. We have new affordances today, thanks to technology. Um, but, but, that, but, but we, we should be cautious in just assuming, oh, we, that means we get to start from scratch. That's not the case. There, there's an awful lot of, of learning to be had from... But you you know, not, do you not think that part of the problem is that, you know, when we think about a question like, what's the future with wikis, is that, is that we, we, we've imagined that the technology is, in of itself is, is solving more of that problem than it actually does. I, the technology... It, it, Technology provides affordances, not solutions. Yeah. People provide solutions, right? So it, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely, yeah. My, my instant response to what, what's the potential of wikis is like, oh, I, I think you kind of already did it. You're yeah. done. Go invent something else now, <laughs> frankly. I mean, you know, wiki the, afforded you this. Now build on that. What's the new thing? The, the, yeah, the power is not the software. The power, the power is in the, the people. In the people. Yeah. yeah. So there was another question in the middle here. Yeah, yeah.
Can't, we can't hear you well. Louder. Louder. Metrics. Yes. Metrics of what? You're always being measured. Well, even even if you aren't, even if we don't have a specific thing we're looking at, you are being measured simply by being present, right? That counts like the the, the fact that you're in the community or you're associated with it is a point. Um, if you interact, that's a point. These aren't, these are metrics that you can look at like alternatively. We say in, in Wikipedia we worry about edit count, right? But we, even if we didn't have an edit count, you're being measured, your reputation is being measured by your activity alone. If you don't do anything, you don't have a reputation. There's no metric there for us to look at. But even, but when you start, even if you open your mouth and say yes or no one time, that creates a metric to define your reputation, whether you're aware of it or not. So I have something to add uh, since there's been this discussion of, you know, sort of the number of edits. Um, there's a, a correspondence. Uh, it may not be so obvious, but what you remember in your brain, what you remember are things that you've seen a lot of and things that are very different from what you've seen before. So I would recommend, if it's possible, to create a, a metric for Wikipedians that would reflect that kind of idea, to value people not just by the number of things that they do, but also by how different is their contribution from those of others. And that may help to create a, a way of valuing people for the diverse contributions that they make. I, I, I'm sure we're running out of time, but I just wanted to one, you become what you measure. Two, you become what questions you ask. Three, Wikipedia is actively participating in building a panopticon of measuring absolutely everything and everyone. Um, and, and you should be very aware and go in there with eyes wide open about the fact that you are actively working on that project. Right? And, and I think it's really, you know, it, it's, it's something that has felt under-discussed to me in the last few days. Um, those things taken in aggregate, metrics, particularly big data, is really good at telling you how many cars are in an intersection and really bad at telling you where people are coming from and where they are going. And uh, we could easily spend multiple days talking about metrics. I'm just really glad you asked the question because particularly for this endeavor around human knowledge, to me there are giant ethical questions around data and us as data, us as data points that feel like deserve very deep interrogation that we can't give in a five minute answer. So I'm glad you asked, but please go do a dinner session on it and get 100 people to argue. And regretfully, Raf is exactly right. We're out of time. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>